While some higher-level researchers, specialized guards, and containment experts at the SCP Foundation have fixed anomalous projects tailored to their very particular set of skills, for many lower-level operatives, including junior researchers, guards, janitorial staff, and even the dreaded D-classes, every day is showing up, spinning the wheel of misfortune, and finding out how you might die today. Will you be hacked to pieces by a murder monster, pulled into a portal, turned into a doll, eaten alive, made into a living nest by bugs, stretched out and broken, drowned, exsanguinated, set on fire, beaten to death by a volley of anomalous tomatoes because you decided to drop a cringeworthy dad joke or a rancid pun? There are perhaps only a handful of anomalies that not only will not harm you, but will actively enrich your life by getting to spend time with them. And of course, chief among these is the legendary SCP-999, also known by its adorable moniker, the Tickle Monster. We don't need to get into too much detail in describing this gelatinous ray of sunshine. His anomalous delightfulness has made him somewhat of a celebrity compared to the murderer's row of terrifying entities and monsters around him. The researcher assigned to him today was troubled, having seen one of his favorite co-workers devoured by SCP-682 the day before. Getting assigned to feeding and checking on SCP-999 today was exactly what he needed. As he entered the room, several bags of M&Ms in hand, the creature cooed, perhaps sensing his tension, and approached him. Immediately, the researcher felt a wave of calm and contentment wash over him, the incredible and rare feeling that perhaps everything is going to be alright for once. 999 rubbed up against his leg as he poured M&Ms into its eager mouth, radiating good vibes the whole time. What an asset. What a gift. And to think this adorable little goober was prophesized to someday save the world. That much seemed almost funny, but he was certainly more than capable of saving the life of someone who hadn't felt the warmth of internal sunshine in quite some time. And for that much, the researcher was profoundly grateful. He left 999's chamber that day with a renewed sense of hope for the future, that maybe, just maybe, they might be able to pull through, to make a difference, to push this crazy ball of rock we call our home in the right direction. Maybe someday, the sun would rise on a perfect world. Who would have thought that a strange sunrise could change everything? Emergency sirens went off across the globe, but in every case, they were drowned out by a terrible, endless chorus of screams. But below all that, you'll hear another gut-wrenching sound, a low but pervasive sizzling like an egg on a hot pan, as billions of human beings started to change their states of matter. The SCP Foundation had fought off and contained so many seemingly impossible threats, from interdimensional horrors like the Hanged, Sealed, and Scarlet Kings, to nightmarish mass killers like SCP-106, The Old Man, SCP-096, The Shy Guy, and SCP-682, The Hard to Destroy Reptile. In their many battles against the anomalous, they developed the incredible methodologies and exceedingly advanced technology. But what good would any of it do when the very center of our solar system decided in an instant that rather being the linchpin of our delicate cradle of life, it would instead be the horrible instrument of all of our demises. This awful hypothetical was answered upon the emergence of SCP-001, a terrible day also known as when day breaks. In the snap of one's fingers, half the world was plunged into terror and death. Rays of stark red light swept through the streets. People lucky enough to be in the shade or inside buildings with a view to the outside saw the people in the streets seize up and begin to shriek in terrible pain. Their skin sagged and their bones liquefied. Their bodies dropped down to the ground and coalesced into gurgling, retching puddles the color of melted flesh. Those who saw this abomination happening would never forget it. It would stay with them for the rest of their lives. It would endure like a stain on their retinas, an afterimage burned into the plasma of an old TV screen. But here's a slight consolation. For most of the human race, the rest of their lives wouldn't be that long. The sudden insanity taking over the world caused the SCP Foundation to do something drastic. Step out of the shadows. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The legendary Foundation motto had been reversed. They would die in the light so that humanity could live on in the dark. Thankfully, the very concept of the day gave them one advantage. 
While one side of the Earth was effectively doomed the second the process began, the other side had a 12-hour head start before the sun turned its terrible eye to them. Sirens went off in the middle of the night, waking people up groggy, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. Every television and radio and internet-enabled device in their home was playing the same message, direct from the SCP Foundation, which now had effectively commandeered the entire US government, along with the rest of the world. It gave them directions to the nearest Foundation containment site, and told them that if they didn't immediately comply and find their way to safety, they would experience a terrible death by sunrise. And if you're at all familiar with human beings, you've probably already predicted that they didn't just calmly wrap themselves up, make their way to their cars, and form an orderly line to the various Foundation containment sites located around them. It was, in fact, total pandemonium. As the solar clock ticked down, slowly marking off the seconds that anyone outside had left to live, the only human beings with a meaningful head start began to go insane in a number of varied and interesting ways. Some who took the situation seriously and acknowledged that the sun was indeed going to wipe out most of humanity simply cracked under the pressure. There were those who went into totally catatonic states, rocking back and forth in the corner and refusing to respond to any stimuli. Some became erratic and violent, with unpredictable behavior that harmed themselves and others. After all, what was the point in acting normally anymore when the complete crumbling of human civilization was imminent and their only hope was some shadowy organization they'd never heard of? Some not heeding the warning seriously enough and prompted by greed and opportunism tried to take advantage of the situation financially. Some smashed windows of local stores and looted or broke into the homes of neighbors who had already fled in hopes of purloughing their property. Others were a little more creative, setting up short-term, everything-must-go, nighttime fire sales for their brands of essential oils, nootropics, and nutraceuticals, claiming all of them had the power to ward off or cure the new effects of the sun. Others completely denied the possibility that any of this was real, and claimed that the messages from this so-called SCP Foundation were actually just a front to take away their freedoms and trap them in underground government camps. They staunchly refused to follow any of the safety guidelines that the SCP Foundation put out, claiming, If you try to take away my First Amendment rights, you're gonna take away my Second Amendment rights! While riding around in their pickup trucks and SUVs blasting Kid Rock's Don't Tell Me How to Live at ear-splitting volumes. Naturally, they had all melted into screeching puddles of liquid flesh by sunrise. Some were not victims of their own bizarre choices, but were doomed by the sudden terrible fear and panic of the circumstances themselves. The highways were gridlocked, cars stuck as far as the eye could see. So many had rushed to escape during the initial wave that means of transport soon became choke points, like clogged arteries in a dying man. People do irrational things when they're scared. Riots broke out in the streets, fighting, killing, burning. Everyone hoping for some means of meager control over a situation that had long been out of any of their hands. Some were too far away with not enough time to close the distance. What could they really do but just sit around and wait to die? The hours marched on as the Earth made its slow turn towards the sun, leaving one decimated half in darkness and the other a sitting duck for its terrible effects. Hundreds of thousands had made their way to the containment sites and safely gotten inside, but still so many millions were left outside. It was a slaughterhouse, one great big global meat grinder, and every moment that passed, the handle turned, and any humans left outside got just that little bit closer to the grinding, gnashing gears below. Site 19 being the largest containment site on the Foundation books also became humanity's only bastion. It was the great hope of escape from the horrors going on outside. The Foundation had figured out so many ways of counteracting deadly anomalous forces before. Given enough time and enough personnel, surely they could figure out a solution to even this. This was, however, when the most startling realization yet swept over all the survivors. Those who were melted by the sudden hostile sun weren't dead. They were very much alive, in fact, but they'd been changed in both body and mind. What had once been humans now became terrible beasts, half-melted gelatinous nightmares that coagulated into even bigger beasts. They got into their head that they were grateful for the transformation, that they had been liberated from their old forms in the old world. They were something so much more now. 
and they wanted everyone else to join them in their liberation. Survivors outside the Foundation containment sites were systematically hunted by these great masses of altered flesh. Even those smart enough to cover every inch of their bodies with clothes to protect from the sun, to only move at night, to carry weapons, were dragged out by meaty tendrils from their refuge in the basements and the lightless hearts of buildings, dragged into the searing gaze of the sun, to melt, to change, to coalesce into something greater. It was the inevitable fate of all of humanity. When most of the stragglers were dragged out and changed, the flesh masses started turning their attention to the Foundation containment sites that were keeping all these poor, deluded people from salvation. They mounted offensives against the bases, which the Foundation, with what remained of their manpower and advanced weaponry, did what they could to repel the attacks. But every single day, it got harder. Thankfully for the people holed up at Site-19, there was one consolation out there to help. SCP-999. The Foundation was at war with the Sun and its terrible disciples, and contrary to many people's beliefs, it takes more than men, equipment, and bullets to win a war. 999 provided the essential element that brought it all together. Morale, hope, the will to go on, even when it seemed like all could be lost. After a long day of battling the fleshy abominations at the gates, Foundation guards, mobile task force members, and even civilian volunteers were drained and traumatized by the horrors that they'd seen. Once a day was over, 999 would move among the ranks, cuddling up to them, warding off the despair that was easy to set in during the downswing of a terrible apocalypse like this. Without his presence, there would be no hope of fighting that good fight. So many of them would have given up, walked into the sun, and joined the monstrous force they were fighting. After all, they seemed happy enough, and it would certainly be easier. 999 had become, once again, an indispensable asset to the SCP Foundation. The solar betrayal may not have been the Scarlet King's doing, well, as far as our current intel suggests anyway, but he was playing a crucial part in saving the world, exactly as predicted. 999 didn't fully understand what was going on outside sometimes, why there seemed to be fewer people as the weeks went on, and why the people there seemed so sad all the time, whenever he wasn't helping them. But he was more than happy to help, whatever the case. Many of the humanoid and some even non-humanoid anomalies, which realistically pose no harm to people inside the site, were released from their containment chambers. They needed everyone and everything they could get in what seemed like a hopelessly one-sided fight against the very concept of being outside. Many of the larger, vacated chambers were now filled with refugees from the outside, many of whom had lost everything and everyone they'd ever known to the horrors out there. 999 made the rounds in these areas regularly, and through the D-Class cots, which had been repurposed into more sleeping areas for the thousands of desperate and terrified refugees. The adjustment to this new life, and to the knowledge of all secrets that had been kept from them for all these years, wasn't exactly easy on their psyches. But spending time with that soft yellow blob that seemed to smell exactly like their favorite scent from the old world made everything better. He was a savior in dark times, slithering from person to person, giving hope where there was none. People opened up about their problems and their fears, which these days were remarkably similar, and though 999 couldn't reply, for many it was enough just to feel like they were being listened to. He was a soft, blobby shoulder to cry on, and after day broke, everyone needed a good, old-fashioned cry. However, one day while wandering the long, dark corridors of Site-19, he saw a different kind of crying. It was a woman with an unfamiliar face, probably one of the rare new refugees bawling her eyes out to a Foundation senior researcher and an accompanying guard with an assault rifle. Hot, fat tears were rolling down her dirty cheeks, her shaking hands clasped in prayer. She was begging the researcher and the guard to let her go outside. She said that her son was still out there, hiding away in the back room of a bank where she used to work. They got separated. She needed to go back and find him. Sadly, the researcher and the guard told her that this was out of the question. Official orders stated that anyone outside the base at this time was to be considered lost. Letting her go out there to find her son would essentially be condemning her to death. No human could go out there safely. But of course, SCP-999 isn't, by any definition, a human. When night fell and everyone else was hunkered down inside, 999 found a small crack in the wall and slithered out of it. It may not have been communicative in the way most humans were, 
but 999 was indeed an intelligent being, and knew intuitively that if it left through a more obvious route, its human caretakers here at the SCP Foundation might try to stop it. And when it came to saving this little boy, 999 refused to let anyone stop it. 999 slithered out and through the broken streets. There were no bodies, of course. It seemed even the dead could be revived and assimilated through the power of the sun. Talk about a mixed miracle. But the broken down world outside Site-19 undeniably reflected the pandemonium that took place here. 999 would need to do his best to find the little boy trapped out here before the sun rose. He lost a few hours even finding his way to the nearest town, where it was safe to assume that the little boy was trapped. He saw those… things on the way there. Those moving, wailing mountains of melted human flesh, each talking and chattering to themselves in a hundred different dead voices. 999 had been cross-tested with SCP-682, and still those monsters frightened him. He decided it would be best to stay away from them and make sure that they never saw him out of here. Eventually, 999 reached the town. Similarly dilapidated and broken down in the months since the world as we had all known it disappeared in a ray of terrible sunshine. More great, gibbering blobs of flesh patrolled the streets, looking for converts to integrate into their biomass. 999 could only hope it wasn't already too late for the little boy. 999 discreetly slithered from building to building until it could identify one as this bank that the boy's distraught mother had been mentioning. It thankfully had some awareness of what a bank actually was, from the years of stressed Foundation employees telling it about the money troubles they were suffering outside of work. It was another great example of it paying to listen. Eventually, it did slither into the correct building, and it heard the extremely quiet whimpering of the boy inside. It could feel the sadness and the fear radiating off of him, as it was the creature's natural instinct to help the needy, and it used those signals like a homing beam to find the scared little boy. He'd hidden inside a broom closet and was quietly weeping into his hands. He hadn't eaten in days, and was only surviving by drinking the filthy water from the mop bucket sitting next to him. 999 immediately embraced the boy, covering him in its healing energy until the tears of the boy's face eventually dried. 999 cooed and chirped pleasantly until the little boy was laughing again, but this momentary joy was soon interrupted. A great heaving weight dragged itself down the hall outside. Both 999 and the boy could sense its monstrous presence. As it got closer, they could hear all those chattering voices, those poisonous whispers. When it passed the door, they heard it speaking, its voice practically vibrating with the hum of malicious lunacy. Turn, pretty flowers. Turn towards the sun. Feel it on your face. Feel yourself change and sluice and mix into us. Become one with our army of one. It must be so lonely to be you, little flower. Walk into the sun and be us. 999 and the boy remained silent in the broom closet for hours as the great shape patrolled the bank outside, searching for converts, for victims. At times, it seemed too frightening to even breathe, fearing that would be enough to make the monster detect them. It felt like an eternity until the monster eventually did slope off and leave them in the comforting quiet and darkness of the closet. Now they might be free. 999 could escort the boy safely back to the containment site and into the arms of his terrified mother. But when they opened the door, they saw a terrible sight. Light in the distance pouring through the windows and the glass double doors. It wouldn't be safe to go out that way. Upon seeing this and putting together what it meant, the boy began to cry. He couldn't take another night in the closet. It was all going to wither from here. Until 999 had a wonderful idea. Hours later, when the Foundation's guards manned the turrets at the entrance of Site-19, waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the melted flesh creatures, they tensed up, seeing a blobbing gelatinous form slithering towards them in the distance. The guards, who'd learned the hard way from too many lost men that it was better to be safe than sorry, drew a bead on the distant shape and prepared to fire, when suddenly their superior raised a hand and said, Wait! Hold fire! I is that 999? And it was. They all stared in astonishment as 999, chipper than ever, came towards them through the sun. It looked as though the opacity of its yellow cytoplasm had increased, 
but other than that, it was unaffected. Turns out the sun couldn't melt what was already melted. The guards parted to allow 999 safe passage into the facility, watching in amazement, and once it was inside, 999's slime parted, releasing its contents. One very relieved little boy. It seemed through turning up its own opacity, 999 had given the boy safe passage through the sun and back into the facility. The boy was saved. It had won. Not long after that, there was a tearful reunion between mother and child, and a brief flash of hope in this dark and terrible time. 999 didn't stop to bask, of course. It returned to its duties, keeping up staff morale and helping the refugees heal from the horrors they'd seen. In its own little way, and for a lot of people, SCP-999 really was saving the world. Or what was left of it, anyway. Almost all cross-testing to kill or pacify SCP-682 had failed miserably. If you haven't seen it, go watch our video on the legendary hard-to-kill reptile to see just how powerful and terrifying this creature is. It faced the Gate Guardian, an SCP with a flaming sword hotter than the sun, capable of tearing your atoms to shreds, and came out fine. In its face-off with the horrifying SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, it broke the Shy Guy's mind and reduced it to gibbering despair. Even SCPs with supposedly unlimited powers simply refused to engage the beast in combat. So, when it was proposed that they test 682 with SCP-999, a creature known among Foundation staff as the Tickle Monster, the idea was considered laughable. 682 had been burned, suffocated, cut up, incinerated, and growled in the faces of the gods. How could this so-called Tickle Monster ever hope to survive an encounter, let alone win a fight? Some even believe that this was the last we'd see of SCP-999. But what makes this story truly remarkable is that that isn't how this played out. As you'll soon discover, SCP-999 is an amazing and unique SCP in and of itself. But its secret origins and its interactions with some other prominent figures in the SCP universe are what make this humble, slimy creature beyond extraordinary. Prepare yourself for the heartwarming, yes, you heard that right, the heartwarming story of SCP-999. Several highly trained agents on 682 detail place 999 into the immortal lizard cell. Compared to the giant reptilian sitting across from it, 999 wasn't much to look at. It's a large orange amorphous blob of anomalous slime. Weighing in at around 120 pounds, SCP-999 was nothing compared to the monstrosity it was supposed to face. While its weight has, in the past, caused minor injuries to some of its human handlers, it has never caused serious or long-lasting damage of any kind to a living thing. Even its diet consists only of candy and sweets, with a particular preference for M&Ms and Necco wafers. It consumes these treats through the cell membrane of its slimy body, much like an amoeba. This extremely stretchy membrane means the creature is highly malleable, including the ability to stretch and flatten itself out to a mere 2 centimeters thick. At rest, the creature takes a dome-like shape around 2 meters wide and 1 meter in height. The closest things the creature has to limbs are prehensile pseudopods. Those are the arm-like projections normally seen on single-celled organisms, of which it has at least three. The more you hear about this utterly harmless creature, the more that matching it up with the pure embodiment of absolute hatred known as SCP-682 feels downright cruel. In absolute contrast to the misanthropic attitudes of the reptile, 999 loves humans. It has a playful dog-like attitude. Much like an overexcited puppy when approached, 999 will react with extreme joy and slither towards the nearest person in order to interact. It will leap onto them, using two of its three prehensile pseudopods to hug the person, while the third nuzzles the person's face, emitting high-pitched cooing and gurgling noises throughout. The creature is apparently pleasant in every conceivable fashion, as even its odor has been reported to smell just like the favorite scent of whoever is smelling it. Examples have included chocolate, fresh laundry, bacon, roses, and Play-Doh. It's almost impossible to oversell just how beloved and benevolent this strange creature is. It's one of the rare sapient SCPs to earn the safe class, and it's allowed to roam freely around its facility at all times, apart from a one-hour bedtime period between 8 and 9 p.m. In the rare instances that 999 has caused harm to a worker at the facility, it immediately began to back away and contract its body while whimpering in a kind of dog-like apology. The closest the Foundation has ever come to having a real incident with the creature was the time someone accidentally fed it a can of caffeinated cola, causing it to become hyper for an hour before becoming visibly queasy. 
you'll be relieved to know that it's since made a full recovery. But what would happen when this whimsical creature is forced to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Foundation's most ill-tempered monster? The employees observing the test watched in suspense as 999 began to enthusiastically slither towards 682. It's no surprise that after being tortured and almost killed hundreds of times during testing, 682 had grown jaded to the cross tests it was regularly subjected to. When it saw this strange orange blob squelching across the ground towards it, it sighed and groaned, expecting the worst. What is that? The creature asked of its gelatinous guest. SCP-999 began jumping up and down in front of 682 like an excited puppy, creating a high-pitched squealing noise. Just as it regarded all living things, 682 thought the creature bouncing around before it was disgusting and hardly worth the effort to destroy. Was the Foundation even trying anymore? With a single vicious stomp, 682 flattened the friendly creature beneath one of its feet. Observers were prepared to charge in and liberate 999 from under 682's claws. But then something truly unexpected happened. The expression on 682's acid-eaten face began to slowly change. It was beginning to smile. Observers recorded a noise what they thought could have been a chuckle, as the creature growled and said, Hmm, what is this? I feel good. While the observers looked on, stunned at what was happening, 999 began to slither and crawl up from between 682's toes. It reformed on its scaly leg and slithered up along its side until it reached the neck. There, it began to nuzzle like it had never nuzzled before. The results spoke for themselves. 682 was grinning and chuckling, repeating a phrase that the Foundation never would have imagined coming from 682. Feel so happy. 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 Just when you thought SCP-999 couldn't possibly be more adorable, you learn about its greatest power, bringing joy. Anyone and anything that comes into contact with the creature, even in passing, will experience a kind of mild euphoria. As one's contact with the creature is prolonged, this overwhelming sense of joy increases and continues long after you've separated from it. Prolonged contact has completely cured depression, anxiety, and PTSD, along with a number of other conditions, including rage and antisocial personality disorders. Serial killers practically become saints after coming into prolonged contact with 999, and in that moment, 682 was no exception. And there truly does not appear to be no exceptions. While causing happiness and joy isn't a dangerous weapon, when it comes to SCP-999, it is an extremely powerful one. And what's more, SCP-999 also appears to have an innate sense for those who need its help most, with a particular affection for the hurt and the unhappy. The creature appears to be a true altruist on a fundamental level, even risking its own safety to help humans during dangerous containment breaches. In one dramatic instance, 999 leaped into the air to block a bullet from making contact with a member of staff. As a result, the creature is pretty much universally loved by all members of Foundation staff. It's the one SCP who has never made trouble for anyone. Back in SCP-682's containment cell, the beast was still smiling and laughing as 999 rubbed against its neck. It was an event so strange, so unprecedented, that the observers in attendance felt like they were hallucinating. For a few minutes, the monster kept dreamily repeating the word, happy. But then, suddenly, the creature began to enter a fit of uncontrollable, booming laughter. It rolled onto its back, slamming its huge tail against the door. It had just fallen victim to one of 999's favorite pastimes, tickle fights, hence how it earned its Tickle Monster nickname among staff. The tickle fight continued until 682 appeared to tire and fall asleep, with a smile still on its face. After 15 minutes of inactivity, two D-Class personnel were commanded to enter and retrieve SCP-999 from the containment cell. They did so successfully, but as soon as 999 was removed, 682 roused from its slumber and released a powerful psychic attack from its entire body while laughing maniacally. It rendered all personnel within a certain distance incapacitated as they collapsed in fits of laughter, allowing 682 to escape and go on a violent rampage. However, in spite of this, 999 showed no fear and helped save some of the bystanders as security officers subdued and recaptured 682. And even after all of this, 999 showed no hard feelings towards 682 and indicated a desire to play again. It's a creature whose capacity for love is so limitless that it's practically immune to fear. 
Which is all well and good, because the true enemy that 999 is destined to face is infinitely more powerful and terrifying than 682 could ever hope to be. What is this monster, and why should 999 have to face it someday? The answers to these questions all lie in the true origins of SCP-999, available only to those with level 5 clearance and beyond. It's a perfect example of how something good can come from the darkest places. There would be no SCP-999 without SCP-231-7. SCP-231 was a collection of seven girls, all impregnated by horrific nightmares in a ritual performed by a cult known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these girls, over the years that followed, gave birth to some of the most horrific monsters imaginable. One of which, according to some, was SCP-682. These beings were manifested by the Scarlet King, a powerful interdimensional nightmare god believed to be behind a great deal of the darkness and horror present within our and many other dimensions. Foundation higher-ups have declared the Scarlet King to be the greatest existing threat to the multiverse at large and SCP-231 was his latest direct interaction with our universe. The only surviving member of SCP-231, SCP-231-7, gave birth in secret. But she didn't give birth to a monster, she gave birth to SCP-999, a being of pure goodness. That's right, the nicest, kindest, cuddliest SCP of all is the direct descendant of a being that's essentially the dark god of all evil. Feel free to take a moment to absorb that. The creature even healed the girl who birthed it, and allowed her to return to normal life with her family once more. From its first moments, SCP-999 was making positive changes to the world around it, and according to ancient texts from a Scarlet King-aligned culture known as the Deivas, SCP-999 is still very much in its infancy, yet it already has the power to pacify its monstrous siblings like the aforementioned 682. It's believed, according to some prophecies and Foundation theories, that the power of SCP-999 will grow exponentially as it matures. Why does this matter? Well, it's believed by some that one day, 999 will grow powerful enough to overthrow not only its own monstrous siblings, but the thought-to-be unstoppable Scarlet King himself. Not through violence or hate, but through the pure force of happiness and love burning out the darkness and purifying the corrupted. While the humble SCP-999 rarely outshines its frightening competitors, to those truly in the know, 999 is one of the most powerful and valuable SCPs in existence, and may be the greatest asset in the Foundation's arsenal for the war against dangerous anomalous activity. After all, what could strike more fear into their hearts than the knowledge that it might be love rather than firepower that finally dethrones the Scarlet King? and for the knowledge that it may one day save everything we know from a fate so much worse than death, with nothing but affection for everyone and everything, it's worth offering thanks to the little orange blob, or at least an extra pack of M&Ms before bedtime. The Scarlet King is a really bad guy. He's a giant interdimensional nightmare god, intent on breaching our reality and wrecking terrible havoc on everything we know and love. He's been responsible for untold suffering and chaos across countless worlds, timelines, and layers of reality. To many, he's even somewhat of a final boss to the SCP Foundation. And just when you think he couldn't get any worse, it turns out that he's also a deadbeat dad. Not only did the Scarlet King once have a cult literally named the Children of the Scarlet King, before it was destroyed by Dr. Montauk and the SCP Foundation, he also had at least seven actual children. Each one is speculated to be a powerful anomaly, but it's tough to find concrete answers as to who or what exactly most of them are. So today we're putting on our researcher hats and digging deep into the Foundation's lore to present our theories on the potential progeny of the SCP Foundation's greatest enemy. And if nothing else, we may finally be able to get this Dark Lord of all evil to start paying all the child support he probably owes by now. First, if you're not well versed in Scarlet King lore, you may be wondering, how exactly does an evil chaos god have kids? Is there a Scarlet Queen out there who prefers to stay out of the limelight? The answer isn't quite that simple, and it has everything to do with SCP-231 and Big Red's most devoted cult, the non-biological children of the Scarlet King. They kidnapped a group of seven girls, 
and performed a number of dark rituals that resulted in them becoming vessels for the Scarlet King's seven terrible kids. These seven girls have become known as SCP-231. Anyone who accesses those files, and trust us, they aren't a pretty sight, will find that the containment procedures mostly involve performing the infamous Montauk procedure on the surviving girls to keep them from giving birth. Six of the seven brides have given birth to nightmares beyond comprehension and are now dead with only one still remaining successfully contained. But here at the SCP Foundation, you need to learn to comprehend the incomprehensible. According to a classified document, SCP-231 may technically be a neutralized anomaly without us even knowing. And incidentally, this gives us our most certain answer on the children of the Scarlet King. On this one, the apple fell very, very far from the tree. According to the secret document, SCP-999, that's right, the adorable Tickle Monster, is the seventh child of the Scarlet King. He must be so disappointed that everyone's favorite little blob didn't want to join the family business of absolute evil. For anyone who doesn't know, SCP-999 is a slimy yellow entity that only seems capable of absolute <laughs> compassion. It brings joy to everyone in its presence, and with prolonged exposure it can even cure disorders like PTSD, anxiety, and depression. He's so good at this that he even cured SCP-231-7, his de facto mother, of her trauma, and allowed her to return happily to her family after some amnestic treatment. The Scarlet King has another good reason to be ashamed of his cheerful, blobby son. Ancient Davidi prophecy dictates that SCP-999 may someday become so powerful that his force of absolute love and good overwhelms the Scarlet King's evil and chaos. Think of him as the Luke Skywalker to the Scarlet King's Darth Vader, though we probably can't expect a cool lightsaber battle between them anytime soon. How disappointing. So if SCP-999 is the quiet, sensitive black sheep of the Scarlet family, who's the golden child who makes his evil father proud? The real chip off the old block? That would be our dear reptilian friend, SCP-682. The malicious lizard heavily implied to be a child of the Scarlet King. If you know literally anything about 682, your reaction to finding out that he's the spawn of cruelty personified is probably, yeah, that makes sense. Just as SCP-999 is the Scarlet King's innocent, optimistic young child, 682 is kind of like his edgy teenager, still in the middle of a misanthropic phase he shows no sign of leaving anytime soon. The fact that 682 appears to find anything about the world around him utterly disgusting seems to be a trade he inherited from his dear old dad. And the fact he seems pretty much impossible to kill also lends credence to the popular theory he's got nightmare god blood running through his veins. Mm -hmm. 682 has also started displaying a particular hatred for 999 ever since an incident where 999 tickled him into submission, so family dinners are probably extra awkward for these two. 999 and 682 are the most certain children, but that still leaves us with five more children to identify. It's worth remembering that the waters are murkier from here on in, but we've searched far and wide through the Foundation archives to find possible answers. If your interpretation differs, remember that it's just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Thankfully, we do have some assistance here. The tale Dust and Blood hinted at what each of the seven children of the Scarlet King represents, and that may help us narrow down our choices here. To put things into perspective, it's believed that 682 was the fourth child to be born, representing wrath, and 999 was the seventh, representing hope. According to this tale, the first of the seven children represents dominion, and as a result, is skilled in the ways of war and has the power to lead the king's forces to victory. According to one Foundation theorist, this child could potentially be SCP-239, also known as the Witch Child. This entity is so powerful that, as part of its normal containment procedures, it's eternally kept in a coma. Why? Because this seemingly normal child has dominion over reality and can change it to her whims. Her thoughts are so powerful that just her brain waves can damage physical matter, and she can make things disappear or manifest in an instant. She's also impossible to kill, with skin that's almost totally impenetrable. Much like SCP-682, She's also frighteningly strong in both the offense and defense department. We're talking about such a powerful telepath that Dr. Clef has campaigned for her immediate termination, just because it's safer that way. 
This is certainly a frightening wonderkin that the Scarlet King would be proud to call his daughter. Next, the second child. According to the prophecy, this child represents longing. The child has the power to bring forth armies, which will help the Scarlet King in his conquest. For this, we actually have a pretty unconventional theory. SCP-029, also known as the Daughter of Darkness. If the name alone wasn't enough to suggest that she's got an extremely sinister father, she also fits the profile of being very aggressive and incredibly hard to kill. But even more damning is her connections to the symbology of longing. One of her most dangerous powers is causing men to fall into almost trance-like devotion to her. After spending time around her, they're suddenly willing to murder in her honor, strangling their victims in hopes of raising Kali, the Hindu god of destruction, whom has many similarities to the Scarlet King. She certainly fits the bill of someone capable of raising armies in the Dark Lord's name. One strike against our Scarlet King connection theory is that the file states the Daughter of Darkness was first discovered in India, which wouldn't match up with the other information we know to be fact. However, while this is a long shot, given the sensitive nature of everything involving the Scarlet King, it's extremely possible that false information was supplied to bury the connection. Considering the cover-ups and lies involving anomalies like SCP-1000, this certainly isn't an unprecedented move on the part of the Foundation. Next, the third child. This child is associated with all things desolation, implying destruction, fire, ashes, pestilence, and death across the battlefield. When it comes to spreading destruction and death on a mass scale, one particular SCP comes to mind. SCP-058, The Heart of darkness. This creature has Scarlet King written all over it. It's evil, it's mysterious, it's pretty much impossible to kill, and it causes mass casualties every time it escapes its containment chamber. It causes fires, whips people to death with its razor-sharp tendrils, and sprays highly corrosive acid from its scorpion-like tail. And it's even red. Given that we know for a fact this entity suddenly emerged out of something that's now been expunged from the records in an undisclosed site, it's extremely possible that the entity 058 came from was SCP-231-3. This is a child that the Scarlet King would definitely be proud of, given that it's impossible to reason with and feels solely motivated by causing destruction, misery, and chaos. We can't think of an entity that better suits the desolation moniker than SCP-058. Next, skipping past SCP-682 at number 4, the fifth child of the Scarlet King is associated with the loose concept of lack. The prophecy then goes into more detail, saying that this child is powerful in the ways of magic and is able to use their abilities to cause great destruction. Here we have another unconventional proposal. What if child number five wasn't actually a child, but children? That's because we think this description perfectly fits SCP-1765, the nightmarish reality-warping sisters, who we think may actually be triplets of the Scarlet King's fifth bride. Now hear us out. These are actually some of the most powerful enemies the Foundation has ever attempted to contain and we know nothing about their past before being bound to a few objects by the serpent's hand. These sadistic reality warpers are so devastatingly powerful that the only action the Foundation can take against them is letting them have free reign over the containment site they currently inhabit. All the Foundation can do is hope they never get bored of tormenting the people inside. As we all know, the Scarlet King despises science, progress, and order. So perhaps a perfect punishment for the Foundation in his many eyes is giving them a taste of their own medicine. The Sisters, though particularly their ringleader, are a perverse shadow of the Foundation's love of the scientific method. They take these methods and use them for an activity that the Scarlet King finds much more enjoyable – tormenting and killing people. Whenever these crafty triplets set their mind to it, their horrifically powerful magic is able to cause massive devastation just like the prophecy for the fifth bride's offspring dictates. And finally, the sixth child of the Scarlet King. The concept associated with this one is hidden, meaning it can change its face and walk unnoticed through creation. It's also said to have the responsibility of opening the ways between worlds and allowing the war to end all wars to first begin. There have been a huge number of guesses for this spot, with some even suggesting SCP-055, the anti-meme, 
But since we're having fun here, we also want to make an even wilder suggestion. We posit that the sixth child of the Scarlet King is Alison Chow, also known as L.S. and the Black Queen, the most powerful member of the Serpent's Hand. We get it, we have a lot of explaining to do, but hear us out. Alison Chow is a member of the Serpent's Hand, or technically many members. Multiple versions of her exist across parallel dimensions in the SCP multiverse. They're mostly all estranged daughters of Foundation researcher Dr. Charles Kears. This estrangement leads them to collaborate in the Wanderer's Library, the secret base of the Serpent's Hand, to conduct raids on the Foundation in revenge. But what if the leader of these alternate Allisons had an ulterior motive? Because in the infinite number of possibilities offered by the multiverse, this one was not the daughter of Charles Gears, but the Scarlet King. She's merely using the pain of her counterparts to manipulate them into accomplishing her true father's goal, undermining the SCP Foundation. Let's break it down. The hidden child is prophesized to walk unnoticed through creation. Not only does Allison Chow appear human, the use of SCP-268, a newsboy cap that causes the wearer to become unnoticed, allows her to walk anywhere through creation without being detected. But most importantly of all, the hidden child is said to be the one who opens the way for the Scarlet King's entrance into our dimension. And Allison Chow has access to the Wanderer's Library, an unfettered access point between dimensions. If one of the infinite Allisons was the secret daughter of the Scarlet King, would the Wanderer's Library not be a perfect way for him to leave his own dimension and enter ours? She could be the final piece he needs, hidden under the nose of the Foundation and the Serpent's Hand, making all the secret power plays to allow for the Scarlet King's eventual bloody revenge on our world. Unless, of course, SCP-999, the family disappointment, stops him first. We realize that some of these theories may seem surprising, but when it comes to the anomalous, especially the Scarlet King, the only thing you can ever expect is the unexpected. Do you agree with our theories? If not, who do you think are the children of the Scarlet King? Let us know down in the comments. One thing is for certain. We hope we never meet any of the terrible tyrant's nasty children. Except the Tickle Monster, of course. He can hang with us anytime. Life at the SCP Foundation isn't exactly made up of sunshine and rainbows. It's less of a good vibes kind of place and more of a this is the solemn work we do as we stand between humanity and the vast unfeeling unknowable realm of mystery and darkness. Sure, sometimes there's a magic vending machine or a teddy bear doctor, but most of the time the Foundation's findings are a lot more bite than they are barn. Thankfully, there's the C portion of that infamous acronym, CONTAIN. They keep their bizarre, astounding findings locked up tight where they can't catch an unsuspecting innocent off guard and ah! Oh, hey there, little buddy. It's okay, you didn't mean to scare me. Relax, everyone, it's just SCP-999. One of the only contained curiosities allowed to roam freely around the halls of the Foundation. Just look at this guy. Has a sentient mass of translucent orange slime ever been so cute? You want some chocolate, buddy? Okay, here you go. It's incredible, really, that the place that houses a neck-snapping sculpture and a haunted chess-playing machine could also be the home of such a delightful little blob. You know, now that I think of it, it's amazing that being in the vicinity of unspeakable horrors day after day has never put a damper on 999's positive attitude. He's got the persistent, cheerful disposition of a Labrador puppy, but how well would SCP-999's inherent wholesomeness hold up against one of the most wicked anomalies contained by the SCP? SCP Foundation. What would happen if the lightest of the light, a slimy piece of pure goodness, came up against a deep, dark evil? Not the omnicidal rage of SCP-682, we all know how that went, but something quieter. Well, let's find out. SCP-999 was having the best day of its life. To be fair, every single day was the best day of the Tickle Monster's life, surpassed only by the day that followed and the one after that. And how could it not be a good life at the SCP Foundation, when there were so many friends to play with, treats to eat, and so much to explore? SCP-999 was enjoying a hearty bowl of M&Ms, picking out and eating the orange ones, its favorites first, when a familiar figure walked into its pen. Dr. Jack Bright, who frequently came by to see the Tickle Monster when he was having a disappointing day, usually because the higher-ups had reprimanded him for breaking the rules yet again. SCP-999 cooed delightfully at the sight of its visitor, 
slithering over to Dr. Bright and enveloping him in an enthusiastic hug. Dr. Bright immediately began to laugh as the creature's euphoric influence took effect. Hey, glad there are no hard feelings about the time I ate a piece of you. Uh, he giggled as 999 patted his face affectionately with one of its pseudopods. Aw, oh, thanks. That really takes the sting out of getting the no chainsaws hammer brought down on me again. He patted the slime with his own hand in return, and satisfied that it had sufficiently cheered him, 999 oozed back over to its breakfast to finish consuming the sugary goodness. Oh, I almost forgot. Dr. Bright pulled something out of his lab coat pocket. It was a small can of cola, appealingly shiny in the light. Want some? SCP-999 gurgled curiously and approached Dr. Bright to inspect the can. He popped it open with an inviting fizz and offered some. Fortunately, Dr. Rhodes was walking by at that exact moment. Don't you dare! She snatched the can out of her colleague's hand. You remember what happened last time. 999 can't tolerate caffeine or carbonation. Dr. Bright pouted like a petulant child. But I wanted to see it bounce. Do I need to add another rule to the list? Dr. Rhodes crossed her arms. Or are you going to behave yourself? Ugh, fine, whatever, I'll find something else to do. Dr. Bright rolled his eyes and left SCP-999's pen with a final friendly wave at the creature. Sensing Dr. Rhodes' stress, the tickle monster nuzzled her leg with an inquisitive gurgle. She smiled indulgently and gave the slime a hug before she followed Dr. Bright down the hall keeping an eye out for any more potentially disruptive antics. Satisfied at having cheered everyone up, SCP-999 went back to its bowl of candy and devoured the remaining treats. But then, there was nothing left to eat, and no one in the room to visit or play with. What was a lovable slime to do? Why explore, of course. SCP-999 had the freedom to roam all over the Foundation site, until bedtime, that is and it loved oozing down the halls, looking for friends to greet and strangers to meet. After all, a stranger is just a friend that the tickle monster hasn't tickled yet. As the slime slid along the floor, it took the time to say hello to everyone it passed by, bumping them, nudging them, or in the case of Josie the half-cat, very gently petting her head with one of its pseudopods. The cat purred, and 999 responded by vibrating its gelatinous body, producing a soft purr of its own. Then Josie was distracted by a dust particle drifting through a beam of light and darted off to chase it. So the tickle monster continued on its way, looking for something new and fun to do. It spotted the perfect new activity. Two guards were walking into one of the sealed containment rooms, a room that the jolly little slime had never been inside of before. Now was the perfect chance to investigate and maybe play tickle wrestling with the guards along the way. It had to act fast though, the door was beginning to close. Rearranging its body, 999 squished itself into a long, thin line, sliding quickly through the crack in the door just before it shut. This new room was very messy, much messier than 999 was allowed to keep its own room. Any spilled chocolate milk or smeared cupcake frosting was either cleaned up by staff or slurped up by the slime itself. But in this room, there was thick black liquid dripping down all of the walls, some of it arranging itself into patterns and words though 999 couldn't read what they said. The guards hadn't noticed the tickle monster's presence yet, and it kept still, excited to give them a wonderful surprise when they turned around and saw that it had followed them inside. But they didn't turn around, they were completely focused on something in front of them. What was it? It was a thick glass case that looked as if it was about to fall apart at any moment. Inside, there was a mask, a porcelain mask of a frowning face with that same strange, dark fluid dripping from its eye and mouth holes. You know the procedure, right? One guard said. He was holding a brand new glass case, shiny and completely empty. <laughs> of course I do, the other scoffed. It's my first time with this anomaly, not my first day on the job. Just open it up and take the mask out and put it in here. He tapped on the case he was holding, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I just said I know, the less experienced guard grumbled. Don't patronize me. He reached towards the decaying case and prepared to unlock it. Wait, did you hear that? Hear what? I thought I heard... <sighs> Never mind. SCP-999 vibrated with excitement. Would they give it some well-deserved attention? Maybe play a game? But no, the guard wasn't talking about the eager orange pal behind him. He was feeling the influence of something much more sinister. Do you want me to do it? The more experienced guard offered. No, just... You, you really don't hear that? That whispering? His colleague just shook his head. Fine, it's just been a long week, I guess. 
He sighed and popped the case open, reaching for the mask inside. As soon as his fingers made contact with the porcelain surface, the black goo dripping onto his skin where he should have been wearing protective gloves, his expression shifted. His eyes went blank, like someone sleepwalking, lost in a dream even as their body moved in the waking world. Frank, what are you waiting for? The other guard nudged him, but Frank said nothing. He delicately lifted the mask out of the glass box, and before anyone could stop him, placed the frowning white face over his own. Only, it wasn't frowning anymore. As soon as its features slipped over Frank's covering him, erasing him, its mouth curved into a malicious smile. Frank, what the hell are you doing? The guard cried out, as the man he had once known grabbed hold of his shoulders. Not Frank anymore. A voice came out from behind the ceramic lips, but it was different, cruel, cold, ancient. Frank's gone out, I'm afraid, and he won't be back anytime soon. The guard tried to break away from the masked man's grasp, tried to reach for the emergency alarm to signal that the containment change had gone horribly wrong, but the mask shoved him into the wall, hard. The guard hit his head and slumped to the ground, unconscious and likely concussed. Well, SCP-999 has had just about enough of all of this. It hated seeing anyone hurt, especially humans, and clearly its help was sorely needed to make things better. It couldn't tell exactly what had upset the man in the mask so much that he was acting this way, but he knew one thing that always cheered humans up. It was time for a bit of good old-fashioned tickle wrestling. SCP-999 hurled itself across the room, enveloping Frank's body from his feet to his neck, and it began tickling him as it did. The force of 999's tackle sent Frank's body careening towards the ground, and when it landed with a heavy thud, the mask flew off his face and skittered across the floor. Now that it could see Frank's face, 999 looked for signs of laughter, of joy, but Frank was dead asleep, eyes closed, jaw slack. His heart was still beating, but he wouldn't wake up. Confused, concerned, and upset at what it had witnessed in this new room, the slime slithered along the floor toward the mask that had caused so much trouble. It seemed to be staring at 999 with its dark, vacant eyes. It didn't look like a toy. In fact, it looked like something that the slime should avoid touching. But it couldn't help but notice that the face had changed back to a frown. Could 999 really leave the mask there on the floor frowning like that? The tickle monster couldn't help it. With a soft greeting by way of a high-pitched cooing noise, it reached out to the mask and picked it up. Though the slime creature didn't have a traditional face for the mask to sit on top of, its influence quickly grabbed hold of 999's gelatinous frame. It stopped moving, stopped gurgling, stopped looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Right now, SCP-999 was being piloted by the possessive mask, and it was looking for a way out. Once it escaped containment, it could find a new host, a proper host, with arms, legs, and a mouth. But for now, this undignified vehicle would have to do. It took the mask some time to learn how to pilot this strange, soft body with its malleable form and odd methods of moving itself around the room. But it slowly adjusted, and wearing the silhouette of the tickle monster like a disguise, oozed out of its containment room and into the hall. Staff walking by barely even noticed 999's presence. They were too preoccupied with their work. They were used to seeing it and giving it a polite nod, but most of them didn't have the time to stop and say a proper hello at this time of day. Perhaps this would be easy after all. The mask had lost its chosen host, but found something even better. The perfect cover, and the chance to hide in plain sight. It could take in the lay of the land, scope out potential exit routes, and ideally slide out of Foundation custody completely unnoticed. The mask began to smile at the thought. As the mask steered SCP-999's body around the site, a peculiar feeling began to gnaw at the back of its mind, like an itch it couldn't quite scratch, something irritating that wouldn't leave it alone. What was that feeling? Inside of its own consciousness, the mask heard a sound. A sweet, high-pitched gurgle. No, that was impossible. And yet somehow, the consciousness of the tickle monster had survived in the face of the mask's power. It was there, still needling at the mask's darkness with that insipid, insistent kindness. Shut up, the mask hissed, frowning. This body belongs to me now. Why won't you just die? Another gurgle, this one even louder, more difficult to shut out. Did this infernal thing ever shut up? 
The mask stopped moving for a moment, concentrating the force of its will. It would drive SCP-999's mind away and re-establish dominance. Just as the mask was grappling with the influence of SCP-999, however, a familiar figure turned down the hall. It was Dr. Rhodes from earlier. SCP-999's exuberance bubbled up to the surface, and the mask couldn't stop its mouth from flipping back to a smile. What? No, that was ridiculous. And yet, the longer the mask was in contact with the vibrant orange slime, so delighted by every familiar and unfamiliar face it encountered, it could feel that horrible, positive influence growing stronger and stronger. It was a nauseating, warm, fuzzy feeling that just made him want to… The mask let out a giggle, then another, and before long it was in the midst of an absolute giggling fit. The mask had laughed before, it had laughed plenty of times, but it was usually a mocking laugh, a cackle of triumph. This was a giggle, though, of pure joy, the sort of sound a small child makes as they chase a butterfly through a field. This was the sound of innocence, of happiness. It was love. Now you listen to me, you vile little worm, the mask growled. It wasn't certain if 999 could even understand it, but it had to show this rebellious creature who was really in charge. Release your grip on me. I have won. You have lost. Your form is mine, and you, nothing more than a puppet for me to pull on your strings and use you to my own ends. Show some respect and defer to me." The voice of the slime creature whimpered in the mask's mind, a sound like a chastised puppy slinking away with its tail between its legs. <laughs> That's more like it, the mask huffed. Dr. Rhodes looked up from her clipboard and spotted SCP-999. She waved, about to greet the creature, when she noticed the horrible mask perched on top. She dropped her clipboard in shock, gasping at the sight. No, she breathed, heart sinking as she saw one of the purest pieces of good in all of the Foundation fall into the forces of the mask. That's right, the mask would have puffed out its chest. If this body had a chest to puff, I've taken a new host. Do you like my selection? It relished the tearful look in the woman's eyes, the horror that caused her hands to shake and her cheeks to go pale. Show me the way to the exit so I might take my leave of this place and perhaps I will spare your life. The mask was just gearing up for a good threat, a really nightmarish one filled with vivid descriptions of mutilation and violence when that disgusting feeling began to rise up again. That warmth, that buoyancy, it made the mask want to, please don't be sad, here, let me give you a hug. Before it could stop itself, the mask slithered the tickle monster's body over to Dr. Rhodes, wrapping around her tightly, not to hurt her, no, to embrace her, to comfort her. Her horror turned to laughter as the mood-lifting effect of 999's presence began to work its magic. Through her laughter, she was also confused. Why? Why? She couldn't finish the question, but it was enough to break the mask out of the spell. It reared back, horrified at its actions. What have I done? What have I done? It slithered quickly down the hall around the corner, away from that woman who had evoked such fond feelings towards her. No, towards all of humanity. The mask steered its body into a bathroom, coming face to face with a mirror. It stared at its reflection, its familiar face and dark eyes dripping their usual fluid, perched atop this alien thing poisoning its mind. What did you do to me? What sort of magic is this? Of course, 999 did not answer, but the mask could feel its presence, could feel its delight in the impact it was having. You're ruining me, the mask groaned. I strike terror into hearts, I drive men to madness, I rend their sanity in two, I... It trailed off, overwhelmed again by the urge to smile, to laugh, to frolic. Though it didn't have a working nose, the mask could swear it smelled an array of heavenly scents, of fresh roses breaking bed in a stone oven, vanilla, and lightly burnt brown sugar. It reached for itself with its pseudopods, about to tear itself off of the slimy body altogether, but it paused. Ah, very clever. I see what your game is. It lowered the pseudopods, brimming with determination. You won't trick me into sparing your life. Once I found my freedom and host worthy of me, I will destroy you, once and for all." But even as the mask made this declaration, the black liquid seeping from its eyes and mouth began to change, to take on a lighter appearance, 
Was it a trick of the light? No, it was. It was orange. Like the gelatinous flesh of the horrid creature it had made the mistake of attaching to. No matter how hard the mask fought, the influence of SCP-999 was spreading. Its mind raced, trying to come up with a new plan, a way to hold on to its identity, but the sound of an alarm blaring outside the bathroom spurred it to get a move on once more. Clearly, Dr. Rhodes had alerted someone that the mask had breached containment. Time was running out. It needed to find the exit fast. It was now or never. The mask oozed back into the hall, speeding up as it went, trying desperately to find a way out before whatever transformation had begun could complete itself. But even as it struggled, it could feel itself changing, warping. It burst into giggles again and whistled a happy tune. It stopped running for a moment, to wave at an armed guard and blow them a kiss. Why had it wanted to leave this facility in the first place? Everyone here was so kind, was so lovely, was its best friend. No, no, must resist, must not give in to the optimism, to the happiness, to the goodness. If the mask had teeth, it would have been clenching them trying to stem the tide of joyful noises that threatened to burst out. It felt like something was tickling it, and the tickling just wouldn't stop. Stop it! The mask dissolved into giggles again. I mean it! It could feel something coming, something big. A loud cracking sound rang out, and just as the guards were closing in on the possessed tickle monster, they watched in awe as cracks spread across the surface of the possessive mask, and all at once, it shattered into pieces. The pieces fell to the floor, where they pulled themselves back together with strands of black goop. Meanwhile, SCP-999 sat there, bouncing with glee, completely unharmed. The Tickle Monster received an extra special ice cream sundae for its bravery and amazing work, and the mask was returned to its containment chamber in a brand new glass case. As the mask suffered an identity crisis for the first time in its existence, SCP-999 curled up in its pen full of sugar and gratitude, and got some well-deserved rest. There are plenty of big secrets at the SCP Foundation, but sometimes you've just gotta wonder, what are the smaller secrets? Here at SCP Explained, we often zoom out to give you a bird's eye view of the bizarre and sometimes inexplicable events concerning a huge number of anomalies. But today we're ditching our telescope in favor of a microscope to take a look into the daily life of one very special blobby boy, SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. We took the liberty of painstakingly stalking, um, <clears throat> I mean observing, SCP-999 going about his daily life, bringing joy to everyone around him. And not only were our otherwise cold, dead hearts thoroughly warmed, we were also able to compile everything we needed to make this video you're watching right now. Welcome, one and all, to a day in the life of SCP-999. 6.30 AM. Rise and shine, happy campers. We discover that the Tickle Monster likes to start his day nice and early. After all, the more daylight you have out there, the easier it is to put the sunshine in people's hearts. So shortly after waking up, SCP-999 uses his little blobby pseudopods to put on some pleasant, easy listening music in his containment chamber. Delightful. He then drinks a glass of delicious soy milk and helps himself to a balanced breakfast of chocolate, M&Ms, and a variety of tasty fruit-flavored gummies. Please note, this is not an acceptable balanced breakfast for human beings. It's important to remember that SCP-999 has very different dietary needs to us humans. Believe me, I tried the SCP-999 diet. All I got was severe sugar headaches and overtime on the toilet. But the less said about that, the better. After eating his delicious sugary breakfast, the Tickle Monster grabs a crayon and starts building his day plan, which is normally filled with a wide array of stimulating activities. Every day is a new journey into excitement for SCP-999. This is part of SCP-999 schedule that we very much recommend you emulate. Setting your goals nice and early may help you solidify your goals nice and early, and also help you feel a warm and fuzzy sense of accomplishment when the day ends and all your errands are complete. But by the time all this is done for SCP-999, it's already 8 a.m. Of course, while setting goals for the day ahead is an important task, 
SCP-999, in its surprisingly applicable wisdom, also knows the power of inspiration. That's why, at around 8 a.m., the Tickle Monster indulges in his morning entertainment before any tasks or cross-tests begin. This largely involves watching cartoons on a television set provided to him by his handlers at the SCP Foundation. SCP-999's favorite shows include SpongeBob SquarePants, Blue's Clues, and The Backyardigans. The Foundation is extremely careful with the programming that SCP-999 is allowed to indulge in, making sure that all of the shows are generally wholesome and sweet, with positive moral messages that one can carry forward into their day. SpongeBob is a particular favorite for that exact reason. The Tickle Monster sees that plucky yellow sponge as a kind of kindred spirit, reminding him to keep a positive, can-do attitude and a sense of childlike fun. After a few episodes of the show, 999 is typically bouncing with joy, and more than feeling SpongeBob's iconic catchphrase, I'm ready! And while it isn't necessarily relevant, we'd also like to state that within the confines of this metaphor, Dr. Gears is Squidward. Moving on. 10 a.m. Now the Tickle Monster is really ready to take on the day. Having filled up on the two essential C's of any prosperous day, candy and cartoons, he's ready to slither out there and make a difference. His first order of business for the workday is sitting in on the daily Site-19 Senior Researcher Meeting, where the top brass of the site is given a collective debrief on the day's tasks and given an opportunity to share any vital information. Of course, morning meetings can be stressful, especially when you work at the SCP Foundation, where your daily task might be, SCP-682 seems particularly cantankerous today. Mind paying a visit to his containment chamber and asking him about it? However, SCP-999 being there in the room is kind of like having the ultimate scented candle. He exudes those chill, relaxing vibes and even the pleasant smell that puts you in a place of profound ease. The Foundation has discovered that since SCP-999 has started sitting in on the morning meetings, both employee satisfaction and task completion have increased. Happy workers, as it turns out, are also hard workers. When the meetings end and the senior researchers are filing out of the room, each one of them gives SCP-999 a little hug or a pat in hopes of thanking him for all he does. This increases their emotional well-being as well as SCP-999's. It's one of the rare everyone wins scenarios you'll find at the SCP Foundation. After the meeting, SCP-999 tends to roam around the site for a while, searching for anyone in need. As you probably already know, the Tickle Monster has an innate sense for when people are in need of his unique brand of anomalous positivity. If a researcher or a guard is feeling down, SCP-999 will have an innate sense of their presence and mercilessly hunt them down to give them some pep they'll never forget. Allow us to give you a specific example. Security Officer Dan Richardson was stressed. While he didn't let on to anyone else working at the Foundation, fearing that showing emotion would make people think less of him, his wife was actually struggling from a severe illness. So when he went into work, even when he was guarding the containment chambers of truly terrifying monsters like SCP-106, he was only ever worrying about her. Nobody else knew, except for SCP-999. When the Tickle Monster sensed Dan's distress, he slithered over and began to climb on him, unleashing his rays of anomalous good vibes. Soon enough, Dan felt a kind freedom he hadn't experienced since the beginning of his wife's illness. Later that day, he felt the courage to visit the Site-19 employee mental health counselor at last and became open about his emotional struggles. It began a long but worthwhile road to recovery, all of which began with SCP-999. And then the Tickle Monster broke for lunch. 12 p.m. At around midday, every day, SCP-999 slithers on over to the main Site-19 cafeteria to enjoy a wholesome lunch with Foundation personnel and some of the other friendly anomalies that do lunch with them. He'll grab a bowl of ice cream and a colorful jello pot from the friendly lunch lady and slither on over to the table where SCP-073 Kane and SCP-343 God are sitting around chatting. No hard feelings about the whole uh, Mark thing, right? God says, biting into his hamburger. It is a process. Kane replies. Any awkwardness that was there before immediately evaporated when SCP-999 entered the scene. Both of these mysterious anomalies smiled and began petting him as he cooed and trilled. God levitated the spoon to feed 999 his ice cream, which Kane thought was a little show-offy, but held his tongue because he was lost in the moment. 
Kane helped 999 peel off the lid to his jello pot with his precise mechanical fingers. Dr. Clef, who was eating a few tables over, also dropped in to give SCP-999 a playful pat on the head. And given that Dr. Clef typically has the sensibility of an Xbox 360 Call of Duty lobby, this show of vulnerability was an exceptional act indeed. Dr. Bright would have done the same, but he was spending lunch in 05 Council detention again because he did something really stupid again. What was it this time? See if you can guess. 1.30 p.m. After lunch, SCP-999 would spend the next half an hour having the nature of his father, the terrifying Scarlet King, explained to him. For those privy to certain secret documents, you'll know that SCP-999 comes from the most unlikely of parents, the interdimensional, universe-destroying monarch of chaos and evil known as the Scarlet King. He was actually the progeny of the Scarlet King's seventh bride, whose son was prophesied to one day defeat and dethrone the Scarlet King, not through violence and hatred, but through a love and kindness so great it burns out the Crimson Khan's darkness. Of course, he's not ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with his estranged father just yet, nor would the Foundation want him to. They've made mistakes in the past by being too gun-ho and prematurely weaponizing anomalies under their care. Just look at the absolute disaster that unfolded when they tried to make Abel part of a mobile task force, and he killed all his Foundation comrades when they ran out of missions to give him. That's why they've decided to take a very different approach with SCP-999. Rather than pushing him too hard, too early, they've decided to start drip-feeding him the knowledge, piece by piece, every day after lunch. Some of the more scholarly researchers have been reading him choice extracts from Davite scriptures concerning the Scarlet King. They always follow it up with a little Rupert the Bear, though, just so things don't get too intense. 2 p.m. After this unique SCP Foundation take on story time is done, SCP-999 is once again free to roam around the site, dispensing joy to whoever needs it most. Something you need to understand about SCP-999 is that he's utterly non-judgmental. Even a beast of pure violence and hatred like SCP-682 is considered a potential friend to 999. You may even remember the time that 999 was able to live up to his name and tickle the hard-to-destroy reptile into submission, inducing a hysterical laughing fit in this otherwise hardcore beastie. That's why 999 would sometimes stray into the dark, spooky areas of the site that most people would fear to tread if they weren't specifically assigned there. For starters, he nestled up against the outside of SCP-049, the Plague Doctor's cell. The sinister surgeon was feeling a little down in the dumps due to his continued failure to stamp out the pestilence and the SCP Foundation's stubborn unwillingness to help him in the task. However, a loving visit from the Tickle Monster, even on the other side of a plexiglass divider, was enough to chase the blues away, just when he needed the encouragement most. This strengthened the doctor's resolve. He would continue his research, no matter how many lives it took to perfect his curative method. Admittedly, not the best result of an interaction with SCP-999, but 999 was at least happy that the peculiar beaked man seemed a little less depressed now. At least, even if the lack of depression may lead to a few further murders down the line. Who would be next on SCP-999's rampage of joyfulness and positive vibes? SCP-999, like the benevolent, is a friend to all children, so he does what he can to improve the quality of life for anomalous children contained by the SCP Foundation. As part of his daily rounds, he makes sure to always visit SCP-053, the young girl, as his positivity aura is too powerful for the girl's anomalous ability to passively cause paranoia and violence to affect him. She often reports having a wonderful time during their sessions, though she wishes her big dragon friend could come join in on their tea parties too. 4 p.m. By this time, SCP-999 is back to roaming again, searching out people or anomalies he can lend a helping hand to. Helping people, if you hadn't somehow realized it by now, is one of 999's greatest joy in life. That's why when slithering near the high-security humanoid containment wing and seeing groups of researchers running for the hills, he got the sense that perhaps he was needed here and decided to investigate further. As all of the researchers ran screaming in one direction, SCP-999 slithered audaciously in the other. He heard one of the researchers yelling, The old man got out! Sound the alarm and run for your lives! Of course, this did nothing to deter SCP-999, even as the containment breach sirens blasted through the air around him. 999 didn't fear death, he only feared failure. 
failure in the task to make everyone around him as happy as possible, up to and including some of the most horrific and depraved monsters the SCP Foundation has ever contained, very much including the monstrous creature coming towards him down the hall. The old man, SCP-106, gave a throaty chuckle as he shuffled down the tiles, his black goo fizzling on the ground. With one hand, he traced his fingertips along the wall, spreading corruption that ate away at the wall like a cancer. With the other hand, he dragged a rapidly melting corpse that had once been a hapless researcher standing too close to the wall of 106's containment chamber. Now, the old man was eager to cause more pain and havoc in the rest of the facility before he was forced back into containment, until he ran into SCP-999 coming towards him in the hallway. Suddenly, 106 felt something change in his mind. His typically sharp, predatory, sadistic thoughts suddenly felt odd and fuzzy, almost formless. It was almost like he'd been hit by some kind of anomalous chloroform that dulled the edge of his evil. And then, he was laughing. Why? Because this strange blobby creature had crawled up onto his body and begun to tickle him relentlessly. It didn't make sense. How come this creature wasn't affected by his corrosive mucus? But it was already too late. He was doubled over onto the floor cackling. And unlucky for the old man, but luckily for everyone else, it was enough to pacify him until a mobile task force with high-intensity lights showed up and shepherded him back into containment. It was a truly humiliating defeat for SCP-106, but at the same time, he'd be churlish to deny that he had somewhat of a good time. 7 p.m. As we get deeper into the evening, SCP-999 still has plenty to do. After all, every day that ends at the SCP Foundation also heralds the end of many people's lives. And that's on a good day, too. Needless to say, there would always be plenty of people who needed cheering up at the end of each day, and nobody was more up to the task than the Tickle Monster. First, SCP-999 decided to make its way down to the Site-19 medical bay to treat everyone who'd experienced varying degrees of horrific injury from a typical day's work at the Foundation. Some were horrifically burned, others were missing parts, some were pretty much catatonic with the mental trauma of the things they'd seen. Many had distinctive fresh wounds that could only come from SCP-682's massive claws and fangs. It was a powerful wellspring of misery. SCP-999 slithered from bed to bed, nuzzling up to the different patients of the medical bay and lifting their moods. You'd be amazed at the medicinal benefits of a positive mindset, and he's one of the few medical treatments that won't utterly destroy you if you don't have insurance. After helping the injured, SCP-999 decided to visit the D-Class barracks. While most of the SCP Foundation looked down on the lowly D-classes, especially given the criminal history of many of them, SCP-999 held no such prejudices. He sensed that the people in the barracks were confused and scared for their safety, and that was enough for him to get in there and help. He slithered through the gangway, observing that some of the bunk beds were empty from the day's less stressful tests. These hardened criminals, many of which were literal murderers, immediately felt themselves softening in the presence of this cheerful, blobby creature. For the first time in many of their long, difficult, and tragic lives, they dared to believe that perhaps everything might be okay sometime in the not-so-distant future. And SCP-999 couldn't be happier about that. 9.30 p.m. As the night winds down, one of the researchers assigned to SCP-999 reads him a bedtime story to help him wind down after an exciting day. SCP-999 tries not to go to bed too late at night, knowing that an early bedtime and an early rise ensure health and energy. Whale song and white noise is played over a small radio, while SCP-999 settles down to sleep, ready to have only the sweetest dreams. So ends another wonderful day. And there you have it, folks. A day in the life of the endlessly adorable SCP-999. Is there anything from the Tickle Monsters daily routine that you think you might start incorporating into your own day-to-day -day lives? Let us know down in the comments. Personally, in a world that can sometimes be cold and cruel, we think having the strength to be a little kinder and smile a little brighter can make a far bigger difference to some people than you'll ever understand. And nobody exemplifies that better than SCP-999. Panic had set in. Researchers were frantic. There was a buzz of activity, not born of excitement, but from sheer, widespread fear. The Scarlet King was coming. 
Nobody at the Foundation knew when, or even how, the monstrous multiversal tyrant would spring free and bring endless chaos with him, but everyone knew it would be soon. They'd all had the same warning, the same nightmare. In fact, it wasn't just the Foundation either. The entire world had shivered in their sleep, sharing in the bad dream of the destruction that was yet to come. The personnel of the SCP Foundation were on high alert. Of course, the organization had been aware of the impending threat of the Scarlet King for longer than almost anyone else, but that was part of the problem. Through some anomalous dream had by everyone on Earth, now everyone else knew. The Foundation was less interested in uncovering the source of the nightmare, and more trying to counteract its potential side effects. That was what potentially offered the Scarlet King the power he needed to enter into reality after all. The more people knew about him, tried to understand or to find the Eldritch Entity, the more power he was able to obtain. We have an army! One member of personnel chimed in during a frantic debate. We have an almost unlimited fighting force that are specially trained to handle anomalous threats, the MTF! Are you crazy? Another argued. The MTFs are certainly not unlimited. At any rate, the Scarlet King might be one of the most powerful beings in the entire multiverse. How can our troops, even our anomalous units, even hope to stand against that? You're proposing sending our people into a slaughter. Uh, they'd all be wiped out in a moment, one of the other researchers concurred. We need to be focusing our efforts on the amnestic rollout. If we can distribute enough to the population, we can wipe their collective memories of the dream from the other night. They'll forget, and that should slow the approach of the Scarlet King. Slow him, maybe, but it won't stop him, the first retorted. Full-scale retaliation is still our best option. Even now, while we try to come up with a strategy that could be enough to draw him in, we're willing him into existence as we speak. Uh, what about deploying another SCP? Came a voice from the edge of the group. It belonged to junior researcher Jake Harrison, a relatively new member of the Foundation who had been reading up on files related to the Scarlet King. He knew that in trying to understand and come up with a way to best the murderous multiversal warlord, that he was inadvertently feeding him power. But Jake seemed to have stumbled on the one solution that everyone else had overlooked. There was already another anomaly that might have been perfectly suited for defeating the Scarlet King. What do you suggest, Harrison? One of the other researchers spat. You really think something like 682 would be willing to work with us and destroy the Scarlet King? That's absurd. I heard 682 is meant to be one of the Scarlet King's children, another remarked. No, not 682, Jake argued, turning to the researcher that had just made a comment about the entity's supposed children, a group of anomalies that we believe to have been born of the Scarlet King himself. But you're on the right track. We use SCP-999. The group of researchers looked dumbfounded at Jake. He couldn't tell if they were about to yell at him or they would all burst out laughing. To his surprise, they actually looked to be considering his proposal. It was widely believed that SCP-999, the adorable blob of orange slime known as the Tickle Monster, was actually the final child of the Scarlet King. That's not entirely implausible, one of the researchers answered. SCP-999 is believed to be an ultimate force for good that could, in theory, defeat his father. Oh, the Scarlet King is meant to be unparalleled chaos. The two could cancel each other out, another theorized. But the Tickle Monster, sorry, SCP-999, it's an infant, a child, someone else pointed out. Even if it could one day beat the Scarlet King, it's nowhere near strong enough to yet. We might have days, minutes even, before he arrives, and I don't know if 999 has the power to stop his father. Then what if we could make him stronger, Jake replied, a risky idea brewing in his head. Surely you aren't suggesting. Suddenly a loud rumbling rang out, like an earthquake, only much louder. And instead of coming from the ground below, the noise was coming from the sky. The Foundation's researchers raced in the nearest window or ran out of the buildings they were in to turn their gazes upward. Scored across the sky above was a deep, blood-red crack, a wound in the fabric of reality itself. It was huge, almost covering one horizon to the next, and everyone looking at it knew what it meant. That crack in the sky heralded the approach of the Scarlet King. Junior researcher Harrison spent the next hour impatiently trying to get a hold of someone, anyone, who could approve his proposal. The O5 Council were already swamped with suggestions for how to stop the Scarlet King, each one contributing to his rapid approach. Eventually, Jake made it through and spoke directly with a representative, an underling for the O5 Council. Listen to me, he urged. I know this isn't your department, but I need someone to sign off on this, please. The lives of everyone in this reality could depend on it. What are you proposing? The clockworks, SCP-914. 
Jake answered. We place SCP-999 inside, speed up the process, and make him strong enough to stop the Scarlet King. It was an astronomical gamble, using the anomalous improvement machine, constructed of a multitude of clockwork components, cogs, gyros, gears. SCP-914 was a device that could be used to enhance or refine any object placed inside its input booth. Depending on the setting, items could be transformed, destroyed, or vastly improved using the clockworks. Rough setting disintegrated any test subject, while coarse dismantled it to its base components. One-to-one -one replaced any item with an almost identical copy. Then there were the fine and very fine settings. The former would cause 914 to improve any item and the later capable of the same but with one key difference. Very fine would refine an object even more usually by giving it anomalous properties. Jake had read up on SCP-914 and knew that the Foundation had permitted researchers to conduct tests using the machine. However, following a catastrophic test, nothing organic could be tested in SCP-914. That was a strict rule. No biological organism or living thing of any description was to be placed within the clockworks. It was Jake's hope, however, that desperate times called for desperate measures. Surely, with the Scarlet King almost upon them, the Council would waive the restriction and allow SCP-999 to undergo refinement. The O5 Council representative's voice cut out after Jake made his suggestion. There was a long pause. Even without the pressure of incoming calamity, the silence seemed to extend for a painfully long time. Suddenly, someone else spoke up in their place, a modulated, distorted voice. It quickly became clear to Jake that he was talking directly to a member of the O5 Council. Under a different set of circumstances, he might have felt honored, but right now it was almost as scary as the threat of destruction by the Scarlet King. Listen closely, junior researcher, the council member said on the other end of the comm line. You may think you understand SCP-914. You may even think that it might aid us in stopping the current crisis, but you are far, far mistaken. You will cease this current course of action immediately. Your proposal has been denied. But wait! Jake protested. Surely it could work. I, I know biological material isn't permitted inside the clockworks, but that doesn't mean it can't affect living matter. SCP-999 is a living organism. If he really is everything we think he is, and we just put him through the refinement process, he could- No, researcher Harrison, the voice barked. Using the clockworks would mean we risk losing 999. What are you talking about? You appear to have a fundamental misunderstanding of SCP-914, junior researcher. The council member chastised. It doesn't merely improve upon existing objects, but replaces them with a new version it creates. If we were to place 999 inside the creature as we know it would be gone forever. And if it really is capable of stopping this catastrophe, we will then have lost our ultimate weapon against the Scarlet King. But... but Jake trying to say. Enough! Every second we waste discussing our options, the more power the Scarlet King is able to amass. So why don't we stop talking and actually do something? The young researcher shouted, giving in to his frustration and losing his temper. The comm line went dead. There was no one on the other end anymore. Another rumbling sound rippled through the building, even louder than the last tremor. Jake ran towards a nearby window and looked out in horror. It was already too late. The red crack above had split open wider, and like a tidal wave, Hordes of nightmarish creatures came spilling out, raining down on the world, and commanding them, sending forth his minions in a flood of destruction, was the Scarlet King himself. Jake was done waiting for permission from the Council. He sprinted as fast as he could through the facility, past panicked researchers fleeing for their lives while security officers and MTF troops abandoned their posts in the futile hope they could survive the end of this reality and all others. Jake forced himself not to pay attention. He needed to find SCP-999. The playful blob was often free to roam around the facility, improving the days of anyone it encountered. So all Jake needed to do was find anyone who seemed happy despite the catastrophe, and SCP-999 wouldn't be so far away. Outside, the world began to resemble the nightmare that everyone had experienced the night before. Cities were burning as monstrous abominations tore through innocent civilians and ripped buildings and cars to shreds, reducing every nearby standing structure to little more than rubble with frightening speed and ease. The Scarlet King and his armies had been waiting for this moment for centuries, millennia, eons even. And now nothing could stop them from unfueling pure, indulgent chaos on this reality.
They had their work cut out for them, subjugating and destroying the entire multiverse, but that isn't to say they weren't enjoying it. People across the Earth were being killed in droves in the name of the Scarlet King. He diverted a significant portion of his forces to attacking the SCP Foundation itself. While the boots on the ground MTF troops, the ones that had remained loyal, were usually a formidable fight, they were no match for the eldritch armies of the Scarlet King. The Horde began to set free other anomalies kept locked up in containment, either by accident when they stormed the Foundation facilities, or intentionally seeking out their cells to spring them. Some SCPs tried to stand up to the Scarlet King and fight back. The likes of the Plague Doctor, the Spectre, and SCP-2800 all tried their best to ward off the oncoming attacks of the Scarlet King's foot soldiers. They lasted longer than those who decided instead to run away, turning heel and trying in vain to escape the destructive reach of the Scarlet King. Even anomalies like SCP-106, who could escape to other planes of existence or pocket dimensions, weren't safe. In hiding, they were only prolonging the inevitable. The Scarlet King would find them all. No corner of the multiverse was safe. And of course, some SCPs thrived in the catastrophe. Creatures like SCP-682, the infamous hard-to-destroy reptile, found themselves free to exact revenge on the Foundation and humanity at large. Of these, not all the anomalies gave away their allegiance. 682 in particular was too busy killing anything it came into contact with, whether they were human or part of the Scarlet King's army. But other SCPs gladly swore fealty with the Crimson Cosmic Conqueror, forming alliances with the entity responsible for setting them loose and joining the mass of monstrosities he had unleashed. And yet, in the midst of all the chaos, the calamity, and the millions upon millions of deaths, one junior SCP Foundation researcher was still searching for the wholesome orange blob. Jake Harrison had put all his chips on SCP-999 and eventually tracked the tickle monster down. The building around him was crumbling, attacks from the Scarlet King and his minions bombarding every second. As Jake ran into the mess hall, his eyes instantly caught sight of the ball of orange slime cowering under a table. Hey, hey, he whispered, hoping to coax it out. It's okay, I know there's a lot going on right now. Hell, it's the end of the world outside, but if you come with me, I, I think we can fix it together. Come on, little guy, what do you say? As if in reply, 999 immediately leaped up out of its hiding place. Jake caught it in his arms, instantly feeling a wave of calm wash over him thanks to the tickle monster's calming anomalous effect. He tried to stop himself from fully succumbing to the good vibes that the gelatinous creature provided. After all, he still had a job to do, and time was short. The Scarlet King and his invading army might have seemed, for the most part, to be indulging in wanton destruction, decimating cities and foundation sites, killing humans left, right, and center. But Jake figured that if there was any method to their madness, then SCP-999 would be at the very center of it. Not even the Scarlet King knew for certain if SCP-999 really was his offspring. Maybe he had heard the rumors and wanted to reach the Tickle Monster just before it had a chance to stop him, if it even could. If the Scarlet King believed even for a second that his supposed son stood a chance at defeating him and ending his reign of terror, then he'd waste no time hunting the orange blob down. His army of nightmarish creatures would comb every corner of the world until they found SCP-999 although they might not think to look inside the clockworks. Placing the smiling, slimy SCP in the input booth, Jake fiddled with the controls for SCP-914. He'd never performed any experiments using the machine before, but it was all pretty self-explanatory, throwing the dial to very fine. He gave a moment's pause, looking at the adorable anomaly in the machine. The warning from the council rang in his ears. If he activated the clockworks, he'd, in effect, be killing SCP-999. Either that or the Scarlet King would do it himself when he found the Tickle Monster. Neither scenario ended well. Then the thundering sounds of the massacre outside got louder. Screams coming from innocent people who were being caught in the Scarlet King's carnage. There was no question about it. If what Jake was about to do really could stop all this mayhem, then it was worth replacing SCP-999 to do it. With a deep breath, he flipped the switch. The clicking and clacking of the clockwork's components whirred into life were drowned out by the approaching tremors. Something was coming. No, he was coming, Jake thought. The very fabric of the building around him started shaking, brickwork and cement crumbling and falling apart as a large hand 
fingers ending in pointed crimson claws wrenched open the roof with ease. Looking up in horror, Jake saw that the sky was a dark shade of red. Towering over it, a colossal crimson-clad warrior looked in on the frightened researcher, horns protruding from its head. Maybe because SCP-999 was still nearby, the blob was offering him some kind of positive mental protection. Otherwise, the mere sight of the gigantic monstrous being above him would have driven Jake and any other mortal mad. The Scarlet King was upon him. Where is he? came a booming voice that sounded like hundreds of screams overlaying each other. The Scarlet King's gaze seemed to shift slightly, turning from Jake as he lay helplessly on the ground to look at SCP-914. The machine had fully activated and couldn't be stopped now. Either through foreknowledge or some kind of cosmic sense, the eldritch monstrosity seemed to know exactly what the device did. No! No! What have you done? The Scarlet King roared. He raised a gargantuan fist and brought it straight down through the air towards Jake. He couldn't run. The Scarlet King was so vast in size that there was no way the researcher would be able to evade the oncoming strike. Jake raised his arms in a futile attempt to protect himself, despite knowing that the Scarlet King's fist would likely plunge through the very surface of the earth below. But then again, maybe the junior researcher just didn't want to watch. There was a pause. The strike never came. It was only when Jake built up the courage to open his eyes that he saw what had happened. A long tendril of orange slime had reached out of SCP-914, forming a protective barrier between Jake and the Scarlet King. Suddenly, with all the force of a tidal wave, the newly refined SCP-999 came pouring out of the clockworks. The Tickle Monster's mass had increased. It was thousands, if not millions of times, bigger. Swept aside and out of harm's way by the orange slime, the junior researcher looked up in amazement as SCP-999 reached up into the sky, able to look its supposed father face to face. The Scarlet King recoiled in horror as the Tickle Monster engulfed him, pulling the cosmic Crimson Plunderer into an embrace. As they hugged, there seemed to be a change in the Scarlet King. The Eldritch Monster had spent all his time since the dawn of creation as a cruel, nihilistic conqueror. He had killed and enslaved, devoured ancient gods, and slaughtered entire planes of existence in his quest to annihilate everything. But now, held tight by his gelatinous son, his heart shifted. It was as if the Scarlet King's eyes had been opened, and he could see the beauty of creation. The sheer overwhelming goodness of SCP-999 enhanced by SCP-914 undid the evil of the Scarlet King himself. Only, it didn't stop. As the orange slime engulfed the Scarlet King in a hug, he began to be unmade. The Tickle Monster, without even trying to harm its father, had been made into such a beacon of pure positivity by the clockworks that the Scarlet King simply ceased to exist. He was unwoven, not killed, but rendered without any purpose. He barely even felt any pain, but at the same time was removed from this and every other universe. And still, it didn't stop. The newly recreated SCP-999 spread across the world like an orange flood. The Scarlet King's armies, the other SCPs, even the few surviving human beings were all wiped away. SCP-999 spread to every corner of the Earth, turning the blue planet orange as he coated it, purging every single scrap of negativity. All hatred, all cruelty, all evil, even that of the SCP Foundation itself. The entire world was unmade by the Tickle Monster, not out of malice, but so that nobody anywhere could cause the Scarlet King to re-emerge. At the same time, all that was left was a planet-sized ball of orange slime, lonely spinning through space. Robed figures with hidden faces stand over seven young women tied up. The robed figures chant phrases both arcane and profane. The leader amongst these dark cultists clears his wicked throat and says, Be not afraid, girls. You are here for something wonderful, to beget seven perfect children for the Scarlet King. How did we get here? And more importantly, what happened afterward? In the near constant darkness that follows the grim but necessary work of the SCP Foundation, there is one bright light that can always be counted on to keep hope alive, to bring a little sunshine into everyone's days. SCP-999 The Tickle Monster 
The sweet, simple creature does nothing but provide an endless source of joy, hugging, playing, and delighting in loving everything around it. But what if I told you that this slimy little friend has hidden depths? A tragic history that seems impossible to reconcile with the happy, playful being we all know and love. How could 999, the happiest SCP ever, have a sad backstory? Well, it's one of the best kept secrets at the Foundation. Before we get to that, let's talk about a Foundation researcher and her brand new job. A new job that would make her privy to some highly classified Foundation secrets. Dr. Izzy Collingwood was delighted to wake up to a call informing her that she had been appointed to one of the most coveted positions at the SCP Foundation. After applying, crossing her fingers, and hoping for the best, she had been promoted to head researcher for SCP-999. What could be better than attending to the kindest, gentlest, cutest anomaly in Foundation custody? Gone were the days of coming into work and wondering if she'd leave in one piece. No more cleaning up toxic spills, fighting to contain killer creatures, or fetching cups of coffee for old doctors that wouldn't give her so much as a thank you. Years of hard work had paid off. Now she could rest on her laurels and do work that she truly enjoyed. There was just the matter of some simple paperwork, and she would be ready to begin this extremely welcome new chapter of her professional life. When she walked into her office to get started on the paperwork, something unusual caught her eye. There was a small stack of files on her desk, with a sticky note attached to the front. There were just two words written on the note to indicate what might await her inside the folders. The truth. She scoffed at first. Very funny, guys! She called out the door, but no one responded. No one came forward to take credit for the elaborate joke. Maybe they were playing the long game. Or maybe she couldn't be sure. She sat down, flipping the first folder open. It was untitled, unlabeled, just plain text on a page. She almost closed it after a brief scan, but the words, The Scarlet King, jumped out at her. She had worked at the Foundation long enough to hear that name more than a few times, often spoken in hushed tones, as if merely speaking his name would bring about some kind of disaster. As she dug deeper into the file, she realized just what she was looking at, the proposed origins of the Scarlet King himself. It was a folkloric explanation, one her scientific mind struggled to wrap around, but she had seen so many strange things over the years, things that defied all rational explanation. Perhaps there was some truth to be found in the myths. The Scarlet King had, according to the file, once been an elder god born from the earliest days of existence in the shadows of the Tree of Knowledge. He had devoured his brothers and sisters, growing stronger with each one he consumed. As his strength increased, so too did his overwhelming pain and hate, his deep desire to destroy the Tree of Knowledge and all living creatures. He declared himself the King of Darkness, and through a series of horrific events, took seven unwilling brides and bound them to him with magical seals. Each bride bore supernatural children, powerful, terrible, and monstrous. The first bride, Atvik, had only a few children. Those few were skilled strategists, exceptionally wise in the ways of war. The second bride was Akhor, overcome with constant despair and desolation. Her children conquered with massive, unthinking armies, never sated and never quelled. The third bride, Aristat, hated her sisters and all she surveyed. The fourth bride, Azieb, took the shape of a great beast. Her children followed in her steed and were invulnerable, their thick hides impenetrable by physical or magical means. The fifth bride was Anhut, blessed with a strong mind and cursed with a fragile body. Her children were gifted in the ways of magic and incredibly destructive. The sixth bride, Adtilif, would not speak. She kept to herself, and like her, her children moved in silence, disguising themselves as whatever they wished. The seventh bride, however, was different. Ahabat was her name, the smallest of the seven, with an unbroken spirit. She birthed mighty heroes that she trained in secret, in hopes that one day, they would overcome her family's darkness and topple the king from his throne. All the while, the Scarlet King wages his unholy war against all things, waiting for the day he can arrive in our realm and unleash absolute destruction. Dr. Collingwood shuddered as she finished reading, an undeniable chill passing over her. This definitely wasn't some kind of prank or hazing ritual. This was something dark, something real. 
She held secrets in her hands, and she couldn't stop reading them now. She opened the next folder. It was a description of a cult, monitored and raided by the SCP Foundation called The Children of the Scarlet King, also known as Group Mendez. During a 16-month investigation of the anomalous religious group, the Foundation's undercover operatives were able to ascertain a great deal of pertinent information on the group. What they found was troubling and of great concern. The group had ties to several wealthy benefactors, as well as links to extremist paranormal groups. Their set of beliefs was relatively simple and disturbing. They worshipped the Scarlet King and were devoted to supporting him in his battle to destroy the Earth and all life as we knew it. The faithful who followed him in this task would be rewarded handsomely with positions of power in this new hellish world. An initial estimate put the cult's membership at approximately 8,000 members, a quarter of whom belonged to the group's primary branch in Alabama. The reporting on the cult was detailed, far too dense and heavily researched to be fake. Again, she had the distinct feeling that someone was trying to tip her off about something the Foundation hadn't wanted to be widespread knowledge. With shaky hands, she picked up the final file, what awaited her inside. There was only one way to find out. She flipped it open and began to read. It was a file on an entity known as SCP-231 specifically SCP-231-7. An addendum was attached to the beginning of the file reading, All personnel assigned to SCP-231-7 must rotate out for one month of psychological counseling after two months on site. SCP-231-7 is to be kept at an undisclosed location. All personnel assigned to SCP-231 will be transported there blindfolded from Site-19 by a route including no fewer than seven different forms of transportation, including but not limited to aircraft, automobile, underground tunnel, and several we cannot discuss here. Removal of the blindfold during the transport process is grounds for immediate termination. Personnel assigned to SCP-231-7 must undergo heavy psychological testing before being cleared to enter the site. Individuals must score at least 72 points on the Milgram Obedience Examination, be unmarried, have no offspring, and express nothing less than total loyalty to the Foundation. Normal psychological screening procedures against access to disorders are waived, so long as the Class D personnel in question has the mental capacity to carry out Procedure 110 Montauk as needed. Personnel who express sympathy towards SCP-231-7's plight and or express a desire to rescue or sympathize towards SCP-231-7 will be transferred to another project without delay. Any actual rescue attempts will be met with immediate termination. Personnel who have served on the staff of SCP-231-7's containment team are not required to divulge that information to others. No official record shall be kept in the names of any staff assigned to SCP-231-7 nor will said service appear in the personnel files of said staff. While on site, individuals assigned to SCP-231-7 will be issued concealing helmets with integrated voice changers to protect their identity. On-site staff are not to remove said uniforms in the presence of other staff members. Off-duty hours are to be spent in private quarters alone. Six Class D personnel are to be assigned to SCP-231-7 each month for the purposes of carrying out Procedure 110 Montauk. Violent criminals are not to be used for this purpose due to the possibility of accidental fatality during the 110 Montauk process. Dr. Collingwood swallowed the lump of dread in her throat, her palms beginning to sweat. SCP-231-7 was a young woman retrieved during a police raid on a warehouse owned by the Children of the Scarlet King. She was one of seven women found there, the first of which went into labor 24 hours after being rescued. She did not give birth to an ordinary child, however. She gave birth to a monster that took the lives of dozens of civilians. She did not survive the birth. The second woman was lost shortly after, also succumbing to the dangers of the creature waiting to be born from her womb. One by one, the survivors, the women chosen by this cult to become the new brides of the Scarlet King, fell. Soon enough, there was only one left. SCP-231-7, kept contained at a Foundation site in a hospital bed that she could never leave. Dr. Collingwood's stomach churned as horrible images flooded her mind. The notes from attending researchers in SCP-231's file insisted they were doing all they could to save the woman, to free her from her fate, but that there was little they could do. Each birth opened a gateway from this world to another, 
to a world of darkness and despair, and they could not allow the final seal to be broken. Simply putting the woman out of her misery would cause the effect to jump to a new host, a new bride. There was nothing to be done. The file fell from Dr. Collingwood's hand as she pushed herself to her feet, running out into the hallway. Who put these on my desk? She shouted, her voice echoing down the empty hall. Well, what do you want from me? But no answer came. Slowly, she returned to her office and sank down into her chair, haunted by what she had read. She had seen horrific things in her time at the Foundation, but nothing that had shaken her to her core quite like this. The silence in Dr. Collingwood's office was broken by the sound of a tinny beep coming from her computer. She turned on the screen and saw the source of the alert, one new message from O5 Command. What could they possibly have to say to her? Could it have something to do with the files that had wound up on her desk? She accepted the message, quickly completed the mandatory multimodal biometric ID scan, and began to read. Hello, Dr. Collingwood, and congratulations on your new appointment as SCP-999's head researcher, one of the cushiest and most enviable assignments in the entire Foundation. SCP-999 is one of the few anomalies in our custody who will not only never attempt to harm you, but will actively try to save your life if you're ever in danger. Though your initial reaction when receiving this assignment was no doubt elation, you may have thought it was odd that such a seemingly low-risk position was assigned by the O5 Council directly. If you had already heard rumors of this prior to your assignment, you probably thought it was mere nepotism. The O5s protecting their friends and loved ones by giving them the safest job possible. Dr. Collingwood sat back in her chair, laughing to herself and shaking her head. She would never admit it, but she absolutely had heard those rumors, even believed them until it happened to her. Unless you are so narcissistic to think that someone on the O5 Council must be your secret admirer, you've likely realized that this is not the case. To understand why this is our concern, you need to know about SCP-999's origins. You may have noticed that its file makes no mention of where it was discovered. This is a deliberate omission. If you are not familiar with the mythology of the Scarlet King, I suggest you read up on him. There's plenty of unclassified information on him in the Foundation database. All that's relevant for now is that he is, to the best of our knowledge, the most powerful malevolent entity in the multiverse. Her stomach dropped at the mention of the Scarlet King. She was right. This was all connected somehow. She leaned forward, eyes darting across the words with increasing intensity as she read on. You've been with us since you were a research assistant, Dr. Collingwood. In that time, I assume you've heard many rumors about some of the horrific things we do here at the Foundation that you've probably never personally witnessed. I regret to inform you that these rumors are true, or at least they were. A thaumaturgical cult calling itself the Children of the Scarlet King enacted a ritual wherein seven young girls became effigies for each of the Scarlet King's seven brides, allowing them to bear his horrid offspring. How they obtained the knowledge to perform this ritual is unclear, since all we ever recovered were handwritten notebooks. Superficial resemblances to some psychic practices has led to some speculate that the children of the Scarlet King may have some ties to modern psychic cults. It is an interesting idea, but no concrete evidence has ever been found to link the two. Investigation into the matter is ongoing. As for the ritual itself, each birth caused more destruction than the last. The writings of the cult's priest predicted nothing less than the apocalypse if the seventh bride gave birth, which could only be prevented if Procedure 110 Montauk was performed without fail each and every day. To our seemingly great fortune, the notebook contained detailed instructions on how 110 Montauk was to be carried out. Needless to say, we found this suspiciously convenient. Why would they devise countermeasures to prevent the very apocalypse they were trying to invoke? We needed more information regarding these entities. Fortunately, our archaeologists have unearthed numerous tablets, scrolls, and artifacts on the ancient Devas. They were a sadistic and warmongering people who were granted unholy power and knowledge by the Scarlet King as a result for the death and suffering they caused. One of the Davite tablets in our possession found covered in dust and blood was a theogony for the Scarlet King and his brides. It was quite informative. The information that we found most relevant to our situation was that the seventh bride was not like her sisters. She was never completely broken by her king's subjugation. 
Instead of monsters, she gave birth to great heroes in the hopes that they would destroy her sister's children and overthrow their father. Thus far, all have failed, but by a vote of seven in favor, six against, admittedly more out of concern for Procedure 110 Montauk's lack of viability as a long-term containment strategy than out of empathy for the girl, the O5 Council decided to believe that the seventh bride still remained unbroken and that her child would be an asset to us. At the risk of causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, SCP-231-7 was relieved from Procedure 110 Montauk following the deaths of SCP-231-1 through-6 and was allowed to give birth. SCP-999 was the result. Dr. Collingwood gasped, her hand flying to her mouth. A research assistant walking by her office paused, looked at her curiously through the window. She waved them off with a forced smile and turned back to the screen. Surely, she couldn't have read that correctly. But no, there it was, plain as can be. Go ahead and read that again. Be sure you understand it in all its preposterous ridiculousness. The Tickle Monster is the child of the Scarlet King. We've been running a counterintelligence campaign ever since, which is why everyone and their mother thinks we've still got a girl strapped to a rack in a bunker somewhere. Let them think that. Far better for everyone that the children of the Scarlet King believe that they're playing us for fools than for them to know that there is a threat to their king. The girl herself is fine, by the way. She was cured of the trauma from her ordeal by SCP-999, at which point it was decided she could be returned to her family so long as they were all given Class F amnestics, implanted with new identities, and relocated to a town at least 1,000 kilometers away from the children of the Scarlet King's nearest known activity. On the insistence of the Ethics Committee, the family was also given a seven-figure payout as compensation for our repeated misdeeds against their daughter, as well as the families of the other SCP-231s. I suppose it was technically malpractice on our part, in case we have any moles for the children of the Scarlet King and the Foundation, as far as anyone else knows, 231-7's family were killed in front of her as part of 110 Montauk. I'm sure you're skeptical. Are we insane? How could our sweet little tickle monster ever hope to dethrone a Lovecraftian horror of unparalleled might? Well, SCP-999 is less than a decade old. It is still just a child and nowhere near its full strength. Even so, its power is incredible. Even brief interaction with SCP-999 can permanently cure severe depression and PTSD, and more recent experiments have resulted in the complete reformation of D-Class personnel, who were previously unrepentant sociopaths. This effect is not chemical, but psychic, and one day it may grow powerful enough that not even the Scarlet King himself will be immune. The experiment with SCP-682 was most remarkable. Based on multiple Davite texts, including descriptions from SCP-140 itself, we are reasonably certain that 682 is the offspring of the fourth Scarlet Bride. If this is true, then SCP-999 is already strong enough to temporarily quell the malevolence of its own eldritch siblings. One day, 999 could very well be strong enough to permanently reform its family members, just as it reforms human beings. It will not overthrow the Scarlet King by force, but with light and love and laughter that can brighten the blackest of hearts. 999 is not, in reality, a safe class SCP. It is Thaumiel. It is the best and really the only weapon we have against some of the most powerful hostile entities known to exist. By all means, Doctor, enjoy the relative safety of your new position, but do keep in mind that SCP-999 is not a mere pet that we fancy. It is one of our most valuable assets and must be safeguarded at all costs. Its safety and well-being are paramount, and you are not at liberty to share this information to anyone without Level 5 or 999 security clearance. As per protocol, an authorized disclosure of Level 5 classified information will result in your termination. This email will automatically delete as soon as you leave the terminal, so feel free to reread it as many times as necessary to remember all the pertinent information. Take good care of our little tickle monster. The fate of the multiverse may well depend on it. Your secret admirer, if anyone asks, 05-1. Dr. Collingwood let out a long, slow breath as her mind did its best to process everything she just read. The message looked official, and when she really thought about it, this all made a twisted kind of sense. 
What could SCP-999 possibly be, if not some sort of mythic hero of divine prophecy? What other explanation could there be for something so utterly, perfectly good? Maybe one day that happy little orange slime would save them all, and do it with a smile. But for now it was just a little, innocent child. No need to burden with talk of heroism, of epic battles between good and evil. For now, she would just pour SCP-999 a heaping bowl of M&Ms, give it a gentle pat, and say thank you. The tickle monster gurgled excitedly in response, nuzzling his new head researcher's hand. He didn't understand what she was thanking him for, but he appreciated it all the same. Chaos had erupted, all hell had broken loose, and nightmares were running amok. Even from her perspective, watching as fleshy abominations tore through the streets of New York City, Eliza Flynn couldn't escape the feeling that the entire world had gone mad. Only moments before, things had been calm, normal, another mundane, uninteresting day in the Big Apple. Now she was watching in horror from underneath an overturned table as a group of things had seemingly appeared out of nowhere. Unbeknownst to Eliza, these creatures were instances of something known as SCP-610, alternatively going by the name The Flesh That Hates. From her hiding place inside the local coffee shop she frequented, they looked like horrific mutated masses of flesh that barely resembled anything even close to human, but that's what they were. Or at least, had been. Eliza had witnessed a barista rushing out into the street trying to get away from a group of SCP-610s that were bashing their appendages against the front window. In trying to make a break for it, the mutated creatures attacked the barista, killing him upon making contact with his skin. It was only a short while afterwards that Eliza spotted his body moving, the infectious process only accelerated by the heat from a nearby car that was on fire. Before long, what had once been a barista, an ordinary person, was now another of the grotesque flesh monsters. Mike, she remembered. His name had been Mike. She'd read it on his name tag when she came in for her morning coffee. He had always smiled, never got the spelling of her name right on her to-go cup, writing it with an S instead of a Z. And now, he was gone. Worse than dead. He wasn't even Mike anymore. Instead turned into another SCP-610 monstrosity. Too petrified to move, terrified of being caught and turned into another of the fleshy nightmares, Eliza stayed hidden. This was it, she thought to herself. Any moment now, one of those things would find her, either breaking through the street-facing window of the coffee shop or slithering in through the rear fire door. Sure enough, the flesh formerly known as Mike the Barista turned. Where had once there been a head was now a featureless blob that had fused with the shoulder, but Eliza could tell its eyeless stare was being directed at her, and she had nowhere to run. Mike's arm, which was now a slimy blood-red tentacle, began slamming against the glass, cracks forming across the surface. Eliza's eyes darted around the room, trying to look for some kind of way out. Her options were limited, and even then, they didn't amount to more than hiding in a storage cupboard and prolonging the inevitable. She needed a miracle. As if to answer her prayers, a blinding white light erupted from somewhere out of view, beyond the window. Turning away, Eliza had to shield her eyes from the searing glow, blinking away spots in her vision as she looked to see what had happened. The SCP-610 creature, Mike, had vanished, a dark outline scorched against the glass as if it had been obliterated by an intense, focused blast. That light, whatever it was, had vaporized it. The sound of commotion came bustling through the door, and distorted, mechanical-sounding voices called out. Hello? Is anyone there? Hello? Is anyone in here? One garbled. We mean you no harm, another said. But you need to leave this place as soon as you can. Cautiously, Eliza stood up from under the table. Standing at the entrance to the coffee shop were a trio of figures. Each one of them had machinery, all manner of metallic components protruding from their bodies, replacing arms, legs, parts of their faces. Eliza stared at them, unsure whether these cyborgs were as harmless as they claimed. One even had a cannon in place of one of their hands, which was still smoking from the blast that had killed the SCP-610 instances outside. Did the flesh make contact with you? One of the figures asked. No, Eliza replied. That's how they spread, right? It's like an infection. 
I watched it happen. Indeed, the cyborg with the cannon arm replied. The flesh being loose is only the beginning. If you are uninfected, then we'd ask you to come with us. We'll explain on the way. Hang on, who are you? Eliza asked, concern on her face. And where are you taking me? We are the Church of the Broken God, one of them answered, and we're getting you out of New York. The idea of a person making their way out of a city that never sleeps on foot would be laughable to anyone that lived there, even before it had become overrun with monsters. But the subway wasn't exactly running on time, and the roads were gridlocked with cars that had either been destroyed or abandoned by their owners. So walking out of New York was the only option. The Church of the Broken God cyborgs explained to Eliza as much as they knew about what had happened. They described an organization, a secret cabal with power spanning the entire world called the SCP Foundation. Apparently this foundation had been responsible for gathering and safeguarding the world from dangerous and unexplained phenomena. You mean like those flesh things? She asked. Exactly. They called those SCP-610. But recently, something had changed. The Foundation had turned its seemingly inexhaustible resources to the goal of exterminating humanity. It was by their hands that instances of SCP-610 had been unleashed in major cities, not just New York, but Delhi, Tokyo, London, and countless others. Those were far from the only anomalies the Foundation had deployed either. As they walked, the cyborgs described how someone called Mr. Deeds had been assassinating heads of state the world over. They also spoke of a horrifying reptile that was now running wild and slaughtering everything in its path. We at the church had to act. Whatever the Foundation's reasons for unleashing this hell, we couldn't sit by and allow them to destroy everything. So we've aligned ourselves with the Global Occult Coalition to assist them in fighting against the flesh that hates. In exchange, we have vowed to help transport survivors to safety. But where can we possibly go that's safe? Eliza interjected. If the Foundation have the reach you say they do, if they have all these horrible creatures at their disposal, what chance do we have at surviving? Well, there is always our path, one of the Broken God's followers replied. The path of standardization, becoming one with machine. Our mechanized parts are safe from the flesh's corruption. If you would consider joining us, Eliza took a quick glance at the metallic components of her cyborg companions. They looked like they hurt as much as becoming a SCP-610 monster would have. She politely declined, although it led to the rest of their journey continuing in an awkward silence. Eventually, the Broken God cyborgs brought Eliza to an extraction point, where they left her in the care of the Global Occult Coalition. Boarding a convoy, her and a number of others were ferried out of New York State by the GOC. For the first time since this had all started, Eliza started to think that maybe she was heading to somewhere safe. That sliver of hope all came crashing down the moment the convoy was attacked. Armed assailants opened fire on the trucks. They were quickly identified by Coalition soldiers as members of the SCP Foundation's mobile task forces. Special operations troops sent out to pick off survivors. In the midst of the firefight, gunfire erupting all around her, Eliza never felt so terrified. One of the GOC officers turned to her as they crouched behind cover. Listen, I shouldn't be telling you this, but there's rumors of a survivor settlement not far from here, he barked. I'll draw their fire. You run. Get as far away from here, fast as you can, and don't look back. Doing as she was told, Eliza sprinted away from the wreckage of the convoy until her legs refused to run any further. She trudged alone through an empty town, abandoned. It felt like a place out of a nightmare. The world was decimated virtually post-apocalyptic. The further she willed herself to walk, the more she could feel herself giving up that she would never even find the settlement, if it even existed at all. Hope had abandoned her, and at her lowest point, Eliza dug her heels in and dropped to the ground, both exhausted and convinced she'd been hiking towards nothing. The feeling of being moved caused Eliza to stir, waking her up from a dream that had been almost as bleak as her new reality. Someone was carrying her on what felt like a stretcher, she quickly realized. Before she had a chance to ask who they were, the pair of shadowy human shapes brought her through the woods to what looked like a campsite. Don't be alarmed, one of them said in a voice that sounded so optimistic it felt almost alien. 
as if this person was from another planet, where things were far less horrible. Looking around, Eliza noticed the glow of a campfire illuminating the nearby trees. A handful of people were huddled together in makeshift tents, resting and wearing contented, almost happy expressions. Then Eliza's eyes were drawn towards something else, some slimy mass gliding around the camp. At first she thought it was another instance of SCP-610, until she saw an amorphous, gelatinous orange blob glowing in the firelight. To the Foundation, it had been known as SCP-999, but to its newfound family of human survivors, this creature was their savior, a bastion of hope and happiness in a devastated hellscape, the Tickle Monster. Welcomed into the survivor community with open arms, Eliza was soon exposed to SCP-999's anomalous effects. The creature seemed to warm to her instantly, greeting her with the enthusiastic friendliness of a small dog. Even after as little as a single interaction with it, she felt her lack of hope and depressed feelings towards the bleakness of the world had almost entirely faded. She felt happiness, pure, genuine happiness, for the first time in recent memory. Thanks to the Tickle Monster, Eliza's entire outlook had completely changed. The same was true for the other survivors that had formed a settlement around the happy orange creature. They had all come seeking an escape, not just a physical place that was out of harm's way, but somewhere they could reject the harsh reality of what the SCP Foundation had done to the world. And SCP-999 had provided that for them all, curing the displaced refugees of their woes, keeping them in perpetually high spirits. Most of them had reached such a point of contentment that they'd forgotten their old lives before the collapse, before the anomalies and the Foundation. Although the Tickle Monster demanded nothing of its newfound family, apart from the occasional playful tickle wrestle, Eliza and a group of the other survivors would venture back to the nearby abandoned town just beyond the woods. Once there, they would scavenge for as much food as they could find, keeping a close eye out for any candy with which to feed SCP-999. Even though they knew 999 was more than happy to provide positivity to the survivors, each one of them felt it was the least they could do for their favorite orange slime ball. There was such a continuous state of love and happiness in their camp that the survivors were hardly phased when a Foundation soldier inadvertently stumbled upon their settlement. Before he could raise his weapon and fire, SCP-999 slid between its friends and the soldier, blocking the path of his bullets. Without any shred of malice or hostility, the delightful blob leaped towards the attacking MTF operative and embraced him. Instantly, the Foundation foot soldier's demeanor changed. Before he had been glassy-eyed, emotionless, like something deep inside him had broken. But after their hug parted, the man was euphoric, grinning in a state of elation for long afterwards. For a time, Eliza sat with the soldier, Sergeant Callows, and listened to him explaining how he wanted to renounce the Foundation, to stay with this community of survivors now he knew SCP-999 was here. Do you remember anything from before? She asked curiously. Before? Callows echoed. You mean, before the Foundation did all this? Eliza nodded, remembering the outside world was hazy now, like trying to recall the vague details of a dream. Not much, the former MTF trooper answered. They wanted us to to kill everyone because of it. What, like the Stephen King book? No, <laughs> Kalos chuckled. They told us it had latched itself on to everyone, all human subconsciousness. It had plans, something really, really awful. So the Foundation's plan was to wipe everyone out. Wouldn't that include everyone who works for the Foundation? No, they um <clears throat> altered us, made it so we couldn't feel pain anymore. He paused, and began giggling uncontrollably, as if he had just understood the punchline to a joke. <laughs> In fact, Kalos said between fits of laughter, that's probably how 999 was able to fix me. Next to him, Eliza couldn't help but laugh too. The humor was infectious. Because you couldn't feel pain? She giggled. <laughs> yeah! Kalos exploded, delighted tears rolling down his face. I lost the capacity for it. I was hollowed out, and that would have made it easy for SCP-999 to fill that space with this. He rolled over onto the floor, still chortling unstoppably, and this didn't stop for hours. The Tickle Monster's powers of positivity had increased exponentially since it had found itself free from the Foundation facility it had used to live at. Much like Callow had explained to Eliza, it had allowed the lovable blob to correct the alteration the Foundation had made to the former MTF sergeant, 
allowing him to feel euphoria in the place of his total absence of all pain. And now, thanks to the influence of SCP-999, the threat posed by both the SCP Foundation and whatever this IT entity was seemed so far away, so irrelevant, and did little to dampen the high spirits of the survivors in the camp. But in their collective sense of bliss, Eliza, SCP-999, and the other survivors became a little oblivious to the outside world and its horrors. Little did they know, there was still danger lurking much closer than they realized, one that had spread from miles away and would very soon be at the settlement. It was Eliza and Callow that first discovered what was lurking nearby. They had both been searching for food in the ruins of the old town beyond the woods, which felt more and more like a completely different world the longer they spent in the camp with SCP-999. As Eliza rummaged through the storeroom of an abandoned supermarket, she heard a scream of agony coming from nearby. Callow. For the first time in months, panic, fear, and adrenaline rocked her system. It almost made her feel sick. She had been so overloaded with positive endorphins that it had practically numbed her to all other feelings. But instinct kicked in, fight or flight hitting her with the force of an ice-cold bucket of water, and she ran out into the store to look for Callow. What she saw gave her a terrified knot in her stomach, the kind she hadn't felt since the day the nightmare had started. The flesh that hates, an instance of SCP-610 was standing in the aisles of the empty supermarket. The sight of the grotesque mutated form shuffling towards her made Eliza freeze on the spot. It took a further moment to realize that Callow had long since stopped screaming. Eliza's thoughts had picked up speed. For the first time in months, she was processing information without it being dulled by the euphoria brought on by SCP-999. It made her realize that this SCP-610 had either killed Callow and he'd soon be turning into one of those flesh creatures, or this was Callow, and he'd already changed. Thinking fast, Eliza sprinted through the supermarket, hearing the snarls of the flesh coming after her. She passed a shopping cart, and in an instance, grabbed its handlebar, turning the metal cage around and racing full force towards the SCP-610 instance chasing her. The cart collided with the blood-red mass of the flesh, the sheer force knocking the creature onto its back and giving Eliza a window of opportunity to race out of the supermarket, watched by a gaggle of mutated creatures. Those of them that still had eyes followed her movements as she ran back towards the woods, toward the camp, and slowly, the flesh that hates began to follow. From the moment that she returned to the settlement, SCP-999 could immediately sense that Eliza was in a state of panic. Instinctively, the creature glided up to her, only seeking to comfort her and make her forget about whatever had troubled her. No, stop, she protested as much as she wanted to not worry about the impending danger. SCP-999 recoiled from her, a wounded expression on its gooey orange face. I'm sorry, it's just we're all in serious trouble, Eliza urged. The other survivors gathered around lazily, each of them seeming upbeat despite her grave news. The flesh, SCP-610, they're here, they found us she explained. They killed Callow, and it won't take them long to find us. They won't come here, one of the survivors replied, not argumentatively, but in a more uplifting and reassuring tone. None of the other anomalies have found us in months, another interjected, smiling. Not even the Foundation can get us here. We're protected. The Tickle Monster keeps us all safe. But what if it can't protect us from the flesh? Eliza desperately tried to warn her fellow survivors, but they were in too much of a carefree state to fear the approach of the flesh that hates. A number of them tried to convince her to relax, spend some time with the tickle monster so she wouldn't feel as bad. As appealing as that sounded, Eliza didn't want to let her guard down. She felt she owed SCP-999 for keeping her and the others alive, for helping them forget the horrific world the Foundation had unleashed. And even if she was the only one, she'd protect it. Night had fallen. The sound of every snapping twig felt like it could be one of the SCP-610s approaching. The rest of the camp was fast asleep, save for Eliza, wielding a flaming branch in one hand to ward off the flesh. Sure enough, through the shadows of the woods and the low light of her torch, she saw shapes began to shuffle towards her. The slick, bloody creatures looked even worse in the dark, shambling over to Eliza, backing away cautiously as she brandished her flame. But the flesh that hates was closing in, more and more of them slithering out from between the trees, causing her to step back in the direction of the camp. Suddenly, an excitable orange mass swept past Eliza. Under the torchlight, she saw SCP-999 approaching the fleshy mutations. No! She cried out, 
Horrified at what they would do to her camp's protector, to her surprise, the flesh stopped in their tracks as the tickle monster wriggled up to them. They seemed to get closer, examining the orange goop as it grinned at them. Then, as if they had lost their innate hostility to anything that they hadn't yet infected, the SCP-610 creatures turned and left. Perhaps it was something within the slimy substance the tickle monster was made of that repelled the flesh that hates. Or maybe it was because it was such a sheer force of overwhelming good, and its increased power, that allowed SCP-999 to pacify the monstrosities. Either way, Eliza breathed a sigh of relief. The grinning orange blob turned to her and smiled, leaping up into her arms and allowing her to carry it back to camp. As SCP-999 turned her relief into happiness once again, it seemed that no matter how bleak the world might be, even in a timeline as horrifying as that of SCP-5000, wherever the tickle monster goes, there will always be the promise of positivity, and with it, a sliver of hope from the friendliest anomaly of all. SCPs will come and go, we know that, but the most important thing in life will always be the anomalies at this containment site, right here, right now. That's family. Thank you, Dr. Toretto, for that inspiring speech. Family can mean many things to many people, and when it comes to the bizarre world of SCPs, family can be found in some very unexpected places. Take the two brothers, Cain and Abel, SCP-073 and SCP-076-2 respectively, as an example. Their shared history goes back centuries, and from what little we've been able to learn directly from the source, the two seem to have the mother of all sibling rivalries. Abel can become visibly enraged at the very mention of Cain's name, whereas Cain has a more subdued response calmly but firmly urging inquisitive researchers not to discuss the matter any further. Whatever bad blood came between them is not fully known, but it likely has something to do with the nature of their anomalous abilities. Cain has the power to drain the lives of plant life with merely a touch, while Abel has the power of resurrection, returning from the grave every time he was dealt a lethal blow. The two were natural opposites, and yet they were also undeniably family and their case is not wholly unique within the SCP Foundation, as there is also another pair of completely antithetical beings in containment who surprisingly share a family tree. And much like the dynamic between SCP-073 and SCP-076-2, there was one side of the pair that could express nothing but distress at the mere mention of the other, and it was, by far, not the one that most would expect. Enter SCP-682 one of the most deadly Keter-class SCPs that the Foundation had ever known, a reptilian monstrosity responsible for multiple containment breaches, capable of withstanding the total punishment of weapons both conventional and anomalous, and hell-bent on following through on the personal, violent destruction of every living being in existence. It is an anomalous creature so overwhelmingly powerful and indestructible that one could easily assume that it was incapable of fear. And in most cases, that would be an astute observation. But not when it comes to the matter of SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. In stark contrast to SCP-682's viciousness, SCP-999 is a bundle of pure, unadulterated bliss. Resembling a smiley-faced glob of sunshine and honey, SCP-999's main anomalous property is its ability to bring lasting joy to all beings that interact with it. Prolonged contact with the little guy has even been proven to cure depression and ease trauma. What's more, SCP-999 seems to actively seek out others to share these benefits with, and often does so through play or other forms of socialization. SCP-999 is benevolent in just about every way that a being could be, and that makes it very different from most of the sapient anomalies in containment. It is especially different from SCP-682, even though they have a common origin. While the family resemblance is far from striking, these two SCPs are half-siblings, not as closely related as Cain and Abel, but that is still a lot closer than most researchers would expect. Both of them were allegedly born from human mothers who had undergone a horrific ritual at the hands of an obscure cult known as the Children of the Scarlet King. As the ominous name of the cult implies, the members of the Children of the Scarlet King worshipped a nightmarish deity known as the Scarlet King. 
This interdimensional superbeing has become known to the SCP Foundation as one of the most threatening anomalous forces in existence, and some have even suggested that the Scarlet King is the ultimate threat that the Foundation must overcome if they wish to achieve their goals. To put it a different way, the Scarlet King is like the last boss of a traditional RPG video game a primal source of all evil and suffering in the world, which must be defeated at any cost. His powers are so great that our world is merely one of many that he aims to conquer and reduce to rubble and ruin. And all of us mortals can take a bit of solace in the fact that the Scarlet King's split interests mean that he is unlikely to invade our world directly anytime soon. He is not without his schemes and contingencies, though of which the vile machinations of the children of the Scarlet King were surely one. The two ordinary human women who would go on to give birth to both SCP-682 and SCP-999 were part of a group of seven individuals total, all of whom had been imprisoned by the children of the Scarlet King and were found in the late stages of pregnancy at the Colts compound. Upon being discovered by the SCP Foundation, these women were placed in containment and designated as SCP-231. Over the duration of their containment, the instances of SCP-231 have given birth to various anomalies. Most of these anomalies have been catastrophically dangerous Keterclass anomalies, and have each been the cause of hundreds of casualties. Those which could be destroyed through violence were neutralized before ever receiving a designation, with the obvious exception being SCP-682 despite the Foundation's best efforts. Even more exceptional is SCP-999, which while just as anomalous and nigh indestructible as the others, did not share its sibling's capacity for cruelty and slaughter. Of all the humans that were unlucky enough to become part of SCP-231, only the mother of SCP-999 was able to survive and make a full recovery from the trauma that she suffered at the hands of the cult. This unexpectedly happy outcome was apparently thanks to SCP-999's ability to heal those around it, including its human mother. SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, and SCP-999, the tickle monster, are the two most notable members of the SCP-231 brood, and while the Scarlet King had more than likely hoped that his actual biological children would join forces to drown our world in misery and pain, this will most likely never come to pass. That is because SCP-682 and SCP-999 are like oil and water, and the one that has been successful in rising above the other has unmistakably been SCP-999. This surprising truth became known to the Foundation after a rather eventful cross-test between the two most contrary spawn of the Scarlet King and the findings from that experiment point towards a possible long-term solution in dealing with the interdimensional elder evil, as well as his children, adopted or otherwise. The cross-test was the product of resilient optimism from the research team, who, against all odds, were willing to bet that SCP-999 could survive an encounter with one of the most infamous Keter-class SCPs the Foundation had on record. Nobody could be 100% sure that 999 would come out of the test unscathed, and there was not an insubstantial amount of fear as everyone's favorite glob of goodness was wheeled into a shared containment for the experiment to be carried out. However, the mere presence of SCP-999 did soothe a great deal of the worried souls, which only instilled more confidence in the head researchers that this would lead to a success. Once SCP-999 was alone in the cell with SCP-682, the main event could begin. SCP-682 had been subjected to a wide variety of cross-tests during its time in containment, and having never met or been aware of SCP-999 prior to the test, was cautiously staring the creature down, preparing for the absolute worst. With a beaming smile on its face, SCP-999 slid forward towards the reptile, causing the Keter-class SCP to instinctively step backward in response. There was something deeply unsettling about this gooey little glob to SCP-682, but it couldn't fathom what from appearance. The overseers of the cross-test were stunned. The sight of 682 retreating from an entity was rare, to say the least and the adorable, unimposing shape of SCP-999 made the scene playing out inside the containment area especially surreal. But no matter how unlikely it seemed, 
SCP-999 had begun the sibling playdate with an insurmountable psychological advantage. As the tickle monster moved ever closer, SCP-682 found itself backed into a corner. With no further options, the reptile brought one of its massive claws down on top of the smiling blob. The entire mass of SCP-999 was splattered into jelly upon impact. For a moment, it seemed as though that was it. The researchers held their breath in shock, hoping that SCP-999 would pull through. And then, their wish came true. The amorphous form of SCP-999 began to reshape itself into the recognizable form that we all know and love. It proceeded to crawl up SCP-682's body towards the nape of its neck. Once there, the tickle monster began doing what it does best. Cuddles. And lots of them. 682 was certainly caught off guard by this unusual occurrence. And more than that, it was falling fast under SCP-999's spell of benevolence. The lizard began to stomp its claws, overcome with sudden bouts of uproarious laughter. It began to vocalize in a way that seemed uncharacteristically enthusiastic for the Keter class anomaly. Happy! Happy! I feel so happy! repeated 682 as it rolled around and thrashed in the cross-testing containment chamber. The merciless tickling from SCP-999 looked like it would be torturous for the big reptile to endure if it wasn't so much fun. On the sidelines, the Foundation personnel cheered on their wonderful little friend 999 as it continued to tickle SCP-682 without stopping. Some of the staff present were even sporting custom t-shirts that read, SCP-999 literally cured my depression. The Tickle Monster did have a large fan base within its containment facility, after all, and returning some of the good vibes that the anomaly had provided seemed like the right thing to do at a time like this. SCP-682's fits of laughter continued for a long while, and the more it went on, the more it seemed that SCP-682 was becoming tired. 999 seemed to sense its sibling's energy level decreasing, ceased the relentless tickling, and instead began to nuzzle 682 and purr into the lizard's ears. Slowly, the quiet and pleasant sounds of SCP-999 lulled 682 into a peaceful slumber. The hard-to-destroy reptile curled up on the floor of the containment cell, almost like a sleeping cat, and began to gently snore away. Once its older and more cantankerous sibling had fallen completely asleep, SCP-999 slithered off SCP-682's back and settled down nearby to rest its own eyes. The research team couldn't help but smile and observe for several minutes before eventually removing 999 from the cross-test containment cell. Predictably, this caused SCP-682 to revert back to its usual violent behavior, and a containment breach ensued shortly after. However, the casualties were kept to a minimum, as SCP-999 bravely helped escort several dozen Foundation personnel to safety by itself. What would we do without you, 999? We know what SCP-682 would do without SCP-999, of course. The hard-to-destroy reptile would be far less threatened. While SCP-999 had expressed continued interest in another playdate with 682, the exact opposite sentiment has been reported from its reptilian sibling, and it is simply not a lack of affection. There is an underlying fear that motivates SCP-682's desire to never interact with SCP-999 again. While some researchers speculated that SCP-682 felt an incredible sense of shame when it was observed being tickled, this is more of an armchair assumption that projects typical human psychology onto an anomalous being. We cannot forget that SCP-682 was born of the Scarlet King, and while SCP-999 possesses the inverse of its father's traits, SCP-682 might have directly inherited the template for its emotional intelligence from that very same being. While most well-adjusted humans try to avoid supposedly negative stimuli, such as embarrassment, anger, sadness, and fear, and seek out positive stimuli, i.e. happiness, pleasure, security, and trust, alien beings with twisted minds like the Scarlet King might have these priorities reversed. To SCP-682, all other living things are disgusting, and it wishes to destroy them. But when this tendency is examined within the context of both SCP-999 and what we know about the Scarlet King, it becomes clear that SCP-682 isn't an excessively prideful being. Moreover, 
SCP-682 doesn't believe that it is doing the world or itself a service by eliminating the aforementioned disgusting beings. We have theorized that SCP-682 and SCP-999 are equal and opposite, but if that proves to be true on the level of internal psyche, SCP-682 might compulsively attack other beings for the same reason that SCP-999 comforts them. It is a continuous expression of empathy, or more accurately, whatever one might call the impossible inverse of empathy. SCP-682 and the Scarlet King are not merely indifferent to the suffering of others. Both of them need to be in the presence of those suffering beings in order to feel any sense of meaning in their existence. After all, love is the strongest emotion, but hate is the second strongest. Imagine now, if you can, why 682 fears 999, a being that represents every unwanted sensation and emotion that it lives its immortal life hoping to avoid. In the eyes of SCP-682, SCP-999 is precisely as horrifying as the reptile is to ourselves. The Skeld-class starship Innobis was still suspended against a backdrop of stars and the colorful glow of distant nebulas, frozen in the inky void of deep space, calm, at least from the outside. But inside the main hull of the ship was far from the silent stillness of the stars. Pandemonium hit as the sounds of a klaxon reverberated through metal corridors, each whale punctuated by the flash of blood-red warning lights. Blue looked up at the blinking, strobing color and instantly knew what it meant. <sighs> Emergency meeting, he muttered to himself behind the visor of his spacesuit. Blue turned heel and ran, his boots clanging against the metal floor of the corridor. He ran as fast as he could in his spacesuit, arriving, panting to the cafeteria. His breathless wheezes fogged up his visor, but beyond, he could still see the other six fellow members of the ship's crew, or at least he thought all six of them were there. It was only as he walked closer that he spotted someone was missing. White, red, green, orange, yellow, and now blue were all present, but where was pink? You took your time, blue, white declared. I was over at the lower engine, he panted back. It's further away, sorry I'm late, ran as fast as I could. What's the situation here? Orange asked. Well, I, I think we should wait for pink to get here before we get into... Red started to say, only to be interrupted. That's why I called the meeting. Green announced. Pink has gone missing. Eh, but that's impossible, Red immediately responded, drawing a glare from White. I saw Pink only a few moments ago. We, we were both over in electrical. To Blue, along with some of the others, that seemed a little bit odd. If Red and Pink had been close to each other, then how had Green known to call the emergency meeting? The room erupted into a brief debate, with White implying in a rather spiteful way that Red knew more than he was letting on. Interjecting, Blue suggested that they all split up and search for Pink, which was quickly shot down. White reminded the rest of the crewmates that their ship was in need of constant maintenance. If they didn't perform the necessary tasks to keep it running, then the Anobis would never reach its destination. Report back here when you're finished, White barked. As they all split off, Blue couldn't help but wonder what had gotten White more agitated than normal. However, little did any of the crew aboard the Anobis realize that they had picked up a stowaway. The creature had been slipping through the ventilation system, curiously watching the assembled group in the cafeteria before they broke away and headed off into the various different areas of the ship. Spotting one of the crewmates, a man wearing a bright orange spacesuit, the thing in the vents felt oddly drawn to him and slithered off down the vents in the direction Orange had been heading. Now, while you might be forgiven for at first expecting this extra passenger to be some kind of alien parasite that uses human bodies as hosts before bursting out of their chest, only to then proceed to kill everything in sight, then you'd be sorely mistaken. Stand down, Sigourney, there are no xenomorphs aboard this ship. No, this slippery little stowaway was none other than the lovable blob of orange slime known as SCP-999, otherwise referred to as the Tickle Monster. Known for being an adorable, amorphous anomaly, resembling a pile of gelatinous orange matter, SCP-999 has long been considered one of the most harmless and affectionate SCPs ever catalogued. It has a habit of honing in on the nearest person and leaping right at them, not as a means to attack them or attach any scary eight-legged egg-laying head-hugging creature to any faces. 
Instead, SCP-999 offers a loving embrace and wholesome nuzzling to a person's face, all the while emitting soothing gurgling and cooing noises, as well as pleasant scents that change depending on what the person it's hugging finds most appealing or calming. While not in any way harmful, and only ever acting out of the most well-meant intentions, SCP-999 had been the one responsible for Pink's disappearance. The tickle monster had been discovered by Pink while he was traveling through a corridor past the medbay, taking the longer route back to Electrical. There, 999 had playfully pounced on the crewmate to offer a hug. This had caused Pink to experience the full effect of SCP-999's anomalous properties, slipping into an overwhelmingly elated state. So, while not currently injured, he was calmly relaxing in a hidden corner of the medbay, with the rest of the crew completely unaware of what was going on. SCP-999 had spotted orange and had been able to recognize the same color as its own jello-like body. Drawn to the crewmate, the tickle monster snuck towards orange while his back was turned, busy cleaning out the filters in the O2 chamber. Before he could turn around and spot the creature, SCP-999 leapt to orange and lured into the medbay with pink. Not long after, Blue had finished up his latest task, fixing up the wiring and storage. Brushing off his hands, he began casually walking back in the direction of the cafeteria, only to see the crimson of red spacesuit zip past. He was rushing down the corridor, almost like he had just been caught, well, red-handed. Something didn't seem right, Blue thought to himself. Red had seemed pretty indignant earlier when Pink had vanished. Although he couldn't say with any certainty if it was because Red really did know what was going on or if they were just nervous. Returning to the cafeteria, however, the crew quickly realized that Orange was now gone too. I'm calling it now, White declared. This was you, Red. You're up to something. I swear I'm not, Red pleaded. It was hard to see how sincere his expression was through the tinted space helmet visor. Well, if anyone else knows anything or saw anything, then come forward, White said to the group. The rest of the crew were awkwardly shuffling on their feet, each one clearly uncertain, but nobody wanting to come forward and be the first to speak. Actually, I, um, <clears throat> Blue found themselves saying. I saw Red dashing around in the corridor. He seemed like he was in a hurry, or maybe he was up to something. M maybe. Look, it doesn't prove anything. You don't know that, Yellow chimed in. Who knows, he may have been eyeing you up as his next victim. Victim? Red exclaimed. Look, I don't know what you're implying here. I haven't killed anyone. Nobody said Pink and Orange were dead, White replied. Unless you know more than you're letting on. I swear, I don't know what's happening. I'm just in the dark as you all are, Red insisted. In that case, prove it, Green interjected bluntly. Prove you didn't kill Orange and Pink. How? Red yelled. How can I prove that? You could prove they're both still alive, said Yellow completely unaware that Pink and Orange were actually still alive. He can't prove it, White announced solemnly, because I bet they're not even on the ship anymore. The missing crewmates were, in actuality, still aboard the ship. In fact, they were having the time of their lives inside the medbay with SCP-999, but that hadn't stopped the rest of the crew turning on Red. Come on, Red, Blue sighed. I mean, you've got to admit you're acting a little, well, not suspicious, but definitely evasive. Oh, sure. What, just because I'm wearing red, you all think I'm some kind of murderous traitor? Red shouted, his desperate, pleading tears obscured by his helmet's visor. This is McCarthyism! Look, why don't you just give us a straight answer? Blue offered, trying to remain reasonable and not join the rapidly growing witch hunt. Because I'm scared! Red insisted. Scared that we'll find out? White yelled, leaping at Red and pinning him down. Quick, the rest of you grab his arms and legs! A struggle ensued, with Red desperately kicking and flailing about. While Green and Yellow gripped an arm and leg, Blue was reluctant. He wanted to urge everyone to calm down and not do anything irrational, but it was already too late. If he opposed, the blame might shift to him. Under White's direction, the crew lifted Red up and carried him to the Anobis' outer airlock. They threw Red past the inside door, which slammed shut behind him as he turned and started slamming his hand against the surface, begging for them to let him out. His pleas fell on deaf ears as White threw a nearby switch. The outer door of the airlock opened, and the vacuum of space pulled Red out of the ship, practically firing him out of the hull like a cannon, leaving him to drift away, alone, and with limited oxygen in his spacesuit. Right, now that imposter's been dealt with, everyone get back to work, White announced. We need to keep this ship in a fit state to move. Blue was speechless. 
He thought they were just going to hold Red prisoner in a secure part of the ship until he calmed down. Instead, he'd aided his crewmates in murdering one of their own. Even the very thought of it made Blue feel sick. And he would have been if he wasn't wearing a space helmet. It all happened so fast. He'd barely had enough time to consider all the facts. After all, White had seemed adamant from the very start that Red was somehow responsible for Orange and Pink disappearing. But he had no concrete evidence to base that assumption on. Then again, where were those missing crewmates? There had been no sign of them, no bodies or discarded suits. Maybe they weren't on the ship at all anymore. What if White was right and Red had killed them? Or worse, what if White had been the one responsible and Blue had just helped him kill an innocent spaceman to cover up his cruel misdeeds? Of course, the surviving crew were so wrapped up in the horrifying moral and ethical implications of the situation that none of them had thought to check the med bay. Meanwhile, SCP-999 had found two more new friends, Green and Yellow. The pair had seemed rather glum, since they had just helped kill Red, and so the orange blob of good vibes had sought them out. Now, the two of them, plus Orange and Pink, who were still fine, were all enjoying the company of the Tickle Monster in the med bay. At the same time, though, Blue was returning from his task of uploading data over an admin, to find only White left waiting for him in the cafeteria. Neither one of them said anything. They'd both already made up their minds. In each one's head, the other was the real guilty party, the culprit responsible for the disappearances and apparent deaths of the other crewmates. Both Blue and White were convinced that the other was truly the imposter among us. Oh, God. In rage, they charged at each other. Rather than act rationally, maybe by sticking together and searching the rest of the ship, the two spacemen engaged each other in a scuffle. You're sus! Blue roared, punching White in the stomach, causing him to stagger backwards. I'm not the one who's sus! White wheezed, rushing back towards Blue and shoulder barging him into the cafeteria floor. You are! You're sus, Blue! They continued their scrap, trading blows until Blue was able to throw a punch that cracked the glass visor of White's helmet. There was a hiss as the air escaped, and White was desperately fumbling with his helmet trying to plug the crack. Blue was able to grab him by his oxygen tank and drag him towards the airlock. Blasting his adversary out into the unforgiving cold emptiness of space, Blue staggered through the ship. He was certain that he had received a broken rib during the fight and hobbled along the corridors towards medbay. When the entrance opened, he stared in disbelief at what he saw. Sat inside were the entire crew, minus the pair who'd been ejected from the airlock, of course. Pink, orange, green, and yellow were playing with a friendly blob of orange slime that seemed to have the energy and enthusiasm of a pet dog. The crewmates were laughing, hugging the tickle monster, and engaging in tickle fights, clearly in a state of heightened elation. In a sudden instant of realization, the horror caught up with Blue. He had just murdered White and Red. For nothing. Both of them were innocent. In fact, nobody on the ship was actually missing. Just before this horrifying epiphany caused Blue to suffer an emotional breakdown, SCP-999 glided across the floor towards him, smiling. As he knelt to pat the orange blob on the head, Blue suddenly felt better about the two deaths he'd been responsible for. Actually, he felt great, compelled to start giggling uncontrollably as he joined his fellow surviving crewmates in playing with the stowaway SCP-999. Although thanks to that delightful distraction, not one of the remaining astronauts realized that their ship was still adrift in space, heading right towards a sun. Now go check out SCP-999 The Tickle Monster and SCP-5167 When the Imposter is Sus for more blobs and imposters.